we resume our tale in age 778. Four years have passed since the defeat of Super Boo, and everything is at peace. Gohan, as Earth's new guardian, is deep in meditation, honing his mind while all around him, the flames of the hyperbolic time chamber rage. Using his powers, Gohan is able to keep the flames from touching his skin, no matter how much they may long to add a new set of burns to his flesh, and mirror the scars that line his arms. However, this alone is not enough to tax Gohan, and so when he is sure he has his power under control, he transforms into Super Saiyan Rage and tells his companions to begin. Moments later, Raditz in his Super Saiyan 3 state, and Trunks in Super Saiyan 2 burst into view, and without hesitation open fire on Gohan. However, the young Guardian easily avoids these key blasts, before hurling one of his own back at them. This forces the father-son duo to split up in order to avoid the blast, and this is exactly what Gohan wanted, vanishing and reappearing in front of Raditz. Grinning, the older Saiyan chortles that Gohan's a clever one to try and take out the biggest threat first, but it won't work for one simple reason. Swinging a punch at his uncle, Gohan asks what that reason is, and with a grin, Raditz replies that he's not the biggest threat anymore. He then grabs hold of Gohan's outstretched hand, spinning the young man round and trapping him in a full Nelson before yelling at Trunks to do it now. From a distance, Trunks grins then fires a double sunday at his restrained cousin, but Gohan is not finished yet, slamming the back of his head into Raditz's nose and using his uncle's momentary distraction to break free. Cupping both hands, he meets the double sunday with a kamehameha, and for a moment the two beams clash. However, it quickly becomes clear who's his strongest as Gohan's Kamehameha eclipses Trunks' double Sunday, slamming into the youngest Saiyan and sending him flying back. Gohan prepares to give chase, a key ball already forming in his hand, but he is stopped when behind him, Raditz yells, PANTS! Looking down, Gohan sees that one of his pants legs is indeed on fire, and so with a roar and a flaring of his aura, he blows away the fire that surrounds them, returning the chamber to its usual endless void of white. Dropping out of Super Saiyan Rage, Gohan sighs that he really thought he had it that time, but Unky Raditz shakes his head, saying it was a good effort though, and praising that Gohan's come a long way. A few moments later, Trunks, also back in his base form, comes flying over, adding his own praise for his cousin's level of control. Gohan, however, is not satisfied, feeling that by now he should be able to control Super Saiyan Rage's key leakage problem. In fact, that's why he started training in the time chamber in the first place, since he figured if he could gain enough key control to keep the flames of this place from getting in and touching his skin even in the heat of battle, then he would be able to keep his own key from leaking out during moments of strong emotional upheaval. But alas, even after all these years, he still can't quite manage it. Raditz, having known Gohan since he was a small boy, can read all of this on his nephew's face, and so smiling throws an arm around him, telling the young man not to be so hard on himself. His power is unlike anyone else's, so everything he's doing is uncharted territory. Naturally, that'll mean things take a little longer to figure out, but when he achieves his goals, it'll be all the sweeter for it. Smiling a little sheepishly and wiping sweat from his brow, Gohan thanks his uncle, saying he's right and expressing his gratitude to both him and Trunks for helping him train. With the cocky grin of youth, Trunks tells his cousin not to sweat it. After all, this is helping him get stronger too, and one of these days, he's gonna surpass his dad, Gohan, and even Uncle Kakarot. This mention of Goku brings the mood down a little, as Gohan reflects on what his father would do in this situation. But luckily, he isn't given long to brood, as Raditz assures him that if Kakarot were here, he'd be incredibly proud of his son for how far he's come, not just with Super Saiyan Rage, but as a man. He then half-jokingly adds that speaking of rage, the three of them will be in for a truckload of it if they miss Bulma's birthday party. Gulping, Trunks asks if his father remembered to set an alarm so they wouldn't be late, and Raditz confidently replies that he did, pulling out a small handheld device. However, this confidence quickly turns to panic, when he realises the device short-circuited at some point during their sparring session, meaning they have no idea how long they've been in here. Fortunately, thanks to Mr. Popo completing the upgrades to the chamber Goku asked for so long ago, they do not have to fear being trapped, but perhaps such a fate would be preferable to facing Bulma's wrath if it turns out they are in fact late. Meanwhile, in the far reaches of the cosmos, a much more successfully maintained alarm is going off, 
and in doing so, the god of destruction Beerus is awoken from his slumber. His angel Whis is there to attend him, and as the god begins his morning routine, Whis questions why his master chose to be woken when he did. At first, Beerus is too groggy to recall, but after consulting his oracle fish, he is reminded of the prophecy of the Super Saiyan God, a being who would supposedly become his arch rival. Eager to find this Super Saiyan God, Beerus queries whether any Saiyans still remain after he gave Freezer the go-ahead to destroy their world. And with a smile, Whis tells him that he is in luck, as a small enclave of Saiyans managed to survive, even coming together to kill Freezer himself. Beerus is floored by this news, having always considered Freezer to be the pinnacle of mortal power. However, Whis assures the god it is true, using his staff to show the Saiyan group attack during Freezer's first invasion. This somewhat dampens Beerus' shock, muttering that it took four of them to stand up to Freezer. But nonetheless, maybe one of them is his fabled Super Saiyan God. He then asks Whis if these four are still on Earth. But Whis shakes his head, saying the leader, a Saiyan named Goku, died during that fight, and now resides in the sacred world of the Kais. Prince Vegeta is similarly indisposed, though fortunately the other two are still on Earth. Not only this, but it seems at least one of the Saiyans were able to procreate with the native Earthlings, since there are currently two half-Saiyans, a boy named Trunks and a young man named Gohan. In fact, this Gohan recently became Earth's protector deity, inheriting the role from Goku, meaning that in the loosest sense of the word, both of them are gods. This piques the Destroyer's interest, and so with a devilish smile, he informs Whis that he thinks it's time they pay these Saiyan gods a visit. With a sigh, Whis replies that he should have known his lord's one-track mind wouldn't allow him to think of anything else until he'd found his Super Saiyan god. Very well, he will take him, though Lord Beerus will have to choose which to visit first since as he already said, one is on Earth, and the other is on Shin's world. Gritting his teeth, Beerus fumes that these selfish Saiyans had to make things difficult by separating. But even so, he quickly makes his decision, and moments later he and Whis are hurtling through subspace towards their chosen target. Back on Earth, Gohan, Raditz, and Trunks touch down on the cruise ship Bulma has chosen as the site for her birthday party, and by their great fortune, they aren't particularly late. Though Bulma is still annoyed with her husband and son, she softens a bit when she sees Gohan with them, asking how he's been. Smiling, Gohan tells his aunt that he's been alright, and that it's his fault they're late, since Raditz and Trunks were helping him with important guardian business. Cocking an eyebrow, Bulma asks is that so? But in spite of her doubts, she lets this slide, telling the Saiyans to go mingle with the other guests. Gohan is more than happy to accept these instructions, and so heads towards where the various tables are set up to see his old friends. The first person he spots is Tien, who along with Chaozu and Krillin have gathered around a table, sharing a drink and catching up. When they see Gohan, the trio greet him warmly, eagerly asking what he's been up to since the fight with Boo, and Gohan explains his recent training with Super Saiyan Rage. The humans praise this dedication, likening it to Goku's desire to constantly improve, much to Gohan's pride, and so with a big grin he in turn asks what they've been up to. Tien as it turns out has taken up a job as head of Capsule Corp security now that Trunks no longer needs a martial arts master, and Chaozu has been working as his deputy. Meanwhile, Krillin has taken to a new career as well, World Martial Arts Champion. Proudly, Krillin recounts the tale of how about a year back he decided to test himself against the other strongest humans to see if any of them could stack up to his old rivals. Unfortunately, no one stood a chance against him, and even the previous champ, a posturing oaf named Hercule got knocked out in just one hit. It wasn't much fun as far as tournaments go, but he's got to admit being a celebrity sure is nice. A gruff voice then laughs that Krillin better not let go to his head, and as they all turn around to see the newcomer, it is none other than Nappa. The big Saiyan wastes no time clapping Gohan on the back, saying he's looking good, like a true Saiyan, with the scars and muscles to prove that he's been through the ringer and come out stronger. Gohan thanks the older man, saying he's not looking too bad himself, before asking what he's been up to these last few years. Nappa laughs that he's mostly been out in space, looking for clues on what happened to Vegeta, though he's been wanting to ask Gohan a favour for a while now. Gohan grins that Nappa need only name it, and the big brute says he'd like Gohan to take him to Otherworld, since King Yemma at least will be able to confirm whether Vegeta's 
still out there, or whether this whole thing's been a fool's errand and the prince has already been reincarnated. Feeling for Nappa, Gohan promises they can go as soon as the party is over, but this discussion is brought to an end when a jolt runs up his spine, drawing all his focus to one thing, two gigantic powers which have just appeared in the atmosphere. Voice cracking with panic, Gohan asks the others if they just felt that, but Tien, Chiaotzu, Krillin and Nappa all give him the same perplexed expression, with Krillin asking if they felt what. Gohan worriedly tells them about the powers, but the other men seem unconvinced, with Nappa suggesting that maybe Gohan's been overexerting himself with all his guardian work and needs to unwind a little. A little annoyed by now, Gohan exclaims that he isn't imagining this, and the others need to ready themselves for battle. From above them, a gravelly voice sneers that it wouldn't do them much good, since from what he's feeling, none of them come close to the strength of a destroyer god. Beside him, a more foppish voice chides that while true, it's impolite to say such things, and as usual, his lord is missing the more important detail. One of these mortals sense their arrival, which they should not be able to do. Gruffly, the first speaker agrees, and the pair touch down softly on the deck of the ship. The gruff one is a purple cat man in blue parachute pants, while the fop is a tall and lean blue man with a staff and exquisitely quaffed white hair. Though our heroes do not know it, this is Beerus and Whis. Not wanting to waste any time, Beerus begins to ask about the Super Saiyan God, but his question is promptly cut off by Bulma, who barrels over to him, demanding to know who he thinks he is disrupting her birthday party like this. Giving her the attention one wouldn't ant, Beerus looks instead to Whis, confirming that she is not Gohan, and when his attendant nods, raising a hand to her kai her, as she is unimportant to his goal. However, before he can carry out this execution, a fist collides with his face, as Trunks, now in Super Saiyan 2 once again, bellows for the cat to keep his hands off his mum. Not even looking at the boy, Beerus slaps him away, and to everyone's shock and horror, he goes flying beyond the horizon in less than a second. Horrified silence falls, until moments later Trunks reappears from the opposite direction, having been sent around the entire span of the Earth by this offhand hit. Without missing a beat, Beerus catches the orbiting youth and slams him headfirst into the deck, telling him to take this as a lesson about minding his manners and not to test his patience again. With a cry, Bulma and Raditz rush in to check on their son, while rather boredly, Beerus asks where was he? Before he can get an answer, however, Nappa speaks up, addressing the god by name. Looking over at him, Beerus's eyes narrow as if struggling to remember the bald bruiser for a moment, before realization strikes him, and he asks if he's correct that Nappa is Prince Vegeta's nursemaid. A little awkwardly, Nappa says that he's actually the prince's former bodyguard, but that doesn't matter right now. What matters is that he's sure he and his friends can help Lord Beerus find whatever it is he came here for, so there's no need to destroy anyone. He then tells the others not to do what Trunks just did, since their guest is none other than Lord Beerus, god of destruction and the most powerful person in the universe, known for wiping out whole planets if they displease him. This quickly changes everyone's tune, with Gohan remembering the reverence with which Shin and Kabito spoke of Beerus, and even Bulma swallowing her pride to obsequiously apologize for her previous rudeness and welcome Lord Beerus to make full use of her party. Beerus grunts that this is more like it, but he's really only here for the Super Saiyan God. Whis, however, tells his master not to be so hasty, since it appears this Earth Woman has laid out a most impressive buffet. Eyes lighting up, Beerus grins that he loves buffet. Very well, he will allow Bulma and her family to live, assuming the buffet lives up to his expectations. Gulping, Bulma promises that it will, then in a low voice hisses to Raditz to go get Lord Beerus and his companions some plates. When the long-haired warrior returns with a pair of plates for Beerus and Whis, along with a glass of expensive champagne for each of them, the deity and his angel set to work piling their plates high with the choicest cuts of everything on offer. They even manage to each get a couple of pudding cups, and so satisfied with their haul, recline on a pair of deck chairs and begin to dig in. Trunks, having learned the value of discretion from his father, stays silent, despite his bruised ego, while everyone else watches on in wary silence, wondering what these intruders will do next. The answer, as it turns out, is to stretch out on their chairs and sunbathe, with Beerus musing that after a meal like that, he might be ready to settle down and have a catnap on this chair for the next few years. However, with a slight clearing of his throat, Whis asks what about the Super Saiyan God? This wakes the Destroyer up, and bolting to his feet, he declares that yes, first he will challenge the Super Saiyan God. He then orders whichever one of these Earthlings is Gohan to come face him. 
Not wanting to stoke the god's ire, Gohan steps up, humbly introducing himself and asking what he can do for Lord Beerus. With a slight smile, Beerus replies that he can answer a question for him. Is he a Super Saiyan God? Briefly, Gohan pauses, then still in his modest voice, admits that he isn't sure since he's never heard that term before. Sighing, Beerus calls this a shame, since if he's not, he'll just have to destroy this world and move on to the Saiyan staying at the sacred world of the Kais. This gets Gohan's attention, and with panic back in his voice, he urges Beerus to wait a minute. He didn't say he wasn't, he's just never heard that name before, though it's quite possible he is, since he is the god of Earth, and has a unique Super Saiyan transformation, unlike anyone else in his family. A smirk in his voice, Beerus says he hopes it's stronger than the form that boy from before used, then with growing impatience tells Gohan to hurry up and show it to him. Thanking his lucky stars that he took the time to learn how to access this form at will, Gohan begins to power up, his eyes going blank, his hair spiking and turning gold, and the core of blue god ki forming at the center of his Super Saiyan aura. Nodding approvingly, Whis states that this form is definitely making use of god ki, before asking Gohan if he attained it after he took over as guardian from his father. Shaking his head, Gohan replies that he actually gained this the first time he went Super Saiyan, since it seems to be a manifestation of the god ki he was born with. Looking interested, Whis nods that this would explain how he sensed the two of them arrive, before adding that he would love to study this form sometime. Smiling, Gohan replies that he'd be happy to help, but it may have to be another time, since this form still has a problem with leaking key, meaning that he can only maintain it for short periods. Tutting, Whis calls this no good at all, but admits that if they're on a timer, he had better use his remaining time to face Lord Beerus and show him the strength of a Super Saiyan God. Spluttering, Gohan asks if he really has to fight Beerus, and the God nods, saying that he has come in search of an arch rival, and unless Gohan proves that he is that rival, he will destroy the young man and his world. Furious at such a callous indifference to the life of everyone on Earth, Gohan grits his teeth saying in that case, he's going to show Beerus just how strong he is in this form. The pair then lunge at each other, their movements so fast no one but Whis can see them. He is also the only one who can sense them, since as per usual when Gohan goes in a Super Saiyan rage, his ki becomes imperceptible to those who do not possess God Ki. For this reason, it seems to everyone else that the God and the Guardian have simply vanished. In truth, they are actually far above them, duking it out, with both getting in a roughly even number of hits. Breaking apart and coming back into view, Beerus admits that he's impressed. Gohan definitely is a god, but that doesn't mean he's worthy to be his rival. For that, he will have to do much better. He then opens fire on the cruise ship, a volley of purple key blasts raining down upon them. Quick as a flash, Gohan vanishes, reappearing in front of each bolt to swat them away into the ocean, while above, Beerus watches with curiosity. Only when the last blast is deflected does he move, appearing in front of Gohan, and planting a kick in his stomach which sends the hybrid Saiyan crashing into the ocean floor. Milliseconds later, Beerus is there too, planting his boot on Gohan's throat and gesturing for him to yield. However, Gohan cannot risk Beerus deciding to blow up Earth, and so fights on, reaching for anything he can get a hold on which might help him in this fight. His hands quickly find themselves around the legs of Beerus' pants, and so taking a page from his father's playbook, he yanks them down. As Beerus' pants are pulled down to reveal heart boxes, the god stares in shock, and this moment of distraction is exactly what Gohan needs, flaring his aura to blow the cat back. As Beerus staggers and pulls his pants up, Gohan charges, headbutting the destroyer's stomach and sending him crashing into an underwater mesa. However, Beerus isn't out of tricks, and so laying his hand on the stone face, Hakai's it so that it vanishes in an instant, sending the stones resting atop it to crash onto Gohan. Unable to dodge this surprise attack, Gohan is buried under the stony avalanche, and from a small distance away, Beerus looks on, disappointment clearly written on his face. That is until a golden light bursts through, as Gohan screams, turning the stones to dust and freeing himself. However, such a feat quickly exhausts Gohan's oxygen supply, and so as Beerus tries to grab him, he kaikais up to the surface. Gasping for air, Gohan finds that the calm ocean he left is not the one he has returned to, as his fight with Beerus has caused the waters to become erratic, with large waves buffeting Bulma's cruise ship and even threatening to capsize it. Knowing that someone will be hurt or worse if they keep fighting in proximity to other people, Gohan decides that it's time they move the venue of their battle somewhere more isolated. 
Moments later, Beerus breaks the surface of the water, and seeing his chance, Gohan takes off into the air. Growling that running won't save him, Beerus gives chase just as Gohan had hoped, and so by staying just out of reach, Gohan is able to steer his opponent to his chosen destination. As it turns out, this is the lookout, both for its distance from humans and the fact that it gives Gohan a home field advantage. Touching down on the lookout's courtyard, Gohan spins, delivering a kick to the onrushing Beerus' chin which strikes true, sending him crashing into the paving stones, and as the god gets to his feet, he mutters that he sees now. Gohan wasn't fleeing, he was leading him here. Very clever. He then grabs one of the scattered tiles, while Gohan does likewise, and as one they rush forward, slamming them into the sides of each other's heads with enough force to shatter the supernatural stones. Staggering under these blows, the two warriors drop their weapons, returning to the way the fight began, with fisticuffs. Once more a flurry of punches and kicks are exchanged, but this time Gohan's aren't quite as effective, and it's clear that he is fatiguing from this form's critical flaw. Seeing this, Beerus presses his advantage, waiting until Gohan is distracted, then sweeping his feet with his tail. As the Saiyan hits the ground, his golden hair turns once more to black, and Beerus squats down, placing a handful of destruction energy to the Guardian's face. In a low voice, Beerus orders Gohan to admit that he's lost, and in a resolute tone, the young man replies that he will if Beerus makes him one promise, that he'll just destroy him and spare Earth. Growling under his breath as if weighing this up, Beerus agrees that if Gohan admits his loss, he will not destroy Earth. This is all Gohan needs to hear, and so in a calm voice he states that he lost, and that Beerus is stronger than him. The young guardian then closes his eyes, anticipating the end, but it does not come. Opening one eye a crack, Gohan looks up at Beerus, who has risen back to his full height and dispelled the Hakai. When he sees Gohan looking, he extends a hand to help him up, but the Saiyan doesn't understand, saying he thought Beerus just said he was going to destroy him. With the air of a teacher explaining something very simple to someone very stupid, Beerus replies that isn't what he said at all. He said if Gohan didn't impress him, he'd destroy him along with the Earth. And then when Gohan admitted defeat, he swore that he wouldn't destroy Earth. Anything Gohan inferred about himself being destroyed is not his fault. Sounding shocked, Gohan asks if that means he managed to impress the god, and with a note of impatience, Beerus grunts that he can see Gohan's potential as an arch-rival. Right now he's still far too weak to be considered anything of the sort, but with a lot of hard work, he believes this young god could be just the rival he's been looking for. Smiling broadly, Gohan promises that he will work hard to be a worthy rival, and with a smirk, Beerus says he better, since if he doesn't, he and Whis can always come back and destroy this world. With a chuckle, the angel says that his lord is quite right, causing both combatants to whip their heads around in shock as they spot Whis seated on the roof of the lookout's main building eating a bento box. Angrily, Beerus demands to know if Whis has been gorging himself while he's been fighting, but the blue-skinned being laughingly tells his master not to get upset. He made sure to get him one of these boxes too so the destroyer can enjoy himself when he's done. Grumbling, the god accepts this, snatching the proffered box from his attendant's hands and telling him he's ready to go home. Nodding, Whis stores his own bento box in his staff, then looks to Gohan, thanking him for entertaining Lord Beerus for the afternoon and promising to come back soon to check out his unique key for himself. Gohan smiles that he'd be happy to show him, and with that, Beerus and Whis vanish, leaving Gohan alone. Looking at where the Destroyer and his attendant just were, the young Guardian reflects on what just happened. For better or worse, he has just taken his first step into a much larger world, and unless he keeps striving to grow stronger and master his power, he will soon come across a threat that he cannot defend Earth from. That is something he cannot allow to happen, meaning he must redouble his efforts until his strength can rival that of a god of destruction. Nine months have passed since the battle with Beerus, and for the most part life has gone back to normal. Gohan still spends his days watching over Earth and training alongside his uncle and cousin, though now they have a purpose to guide them. No longer is the danger some vague possibility that may never arise, but instead the very real threat of Beerus' displeasure hangs over them like a storm cloud, waiting to break at any moment and strike them all down with its lightning. No one feels this pressure to perform more than Gohan, as he is Beerus' chosen rival, though conversely because of this pressure, he quickly finds his progress going in reverse, with his stress and over-usage of Super Saiyan Rage in an attempt to master its key leakage, causing him to fatigue and lose control over the form faster and faster with each subsequent transformation. 
It is a dire state of affairs, as each failure only makes Gohan more anxious, thus perpetuating the cycle. Thankfully, Gohan is smart enough to both see the issue before him and to realise that he is incapable of resolving it on his own. For this reason, he seeks out help from those he trusts and respects, though here a barrier presents itself. Since as Guardian, Gohan feels that it would be inappropriate to share his worries around Earth's potential destruction with any of the people he is supposed to be protecting. And so with nowhere else to turn, he reaches out to the one person he knows who will understand his situation and will not judge him for his fears. That person is Goku, and after getting Trunks to fill in for him as interim guardian for a few hours, he heads off to the sacred world of the Kais, where his dad is waiting to greet him with open arms. After a brief hug, the pair begin to catch up, with Gohan recounting his problems and the worries he has for what will happen if Beerus comes back and he's not up to the god's standard. Shin, who has been listening in, expresses his understanding, knowing firsthand the terror Beerus can evoke. Though with a smile, he adds that he has faith in Gohan, having witnessed his growth from a scared young boy into the vanquisher of Majin Buu and hero of the universe. With a smile of his own, Gohan thanks the Kai, but before he can say more, Goku stops him, saying that Shin has given him an idea. Curiously, Gohan asks what it is, and Goku points out that both of their growth here was due to having Shin and Kabito to mentor them. Perhaps that's what he needs again, a teacher who can help him overcome the problems he's facing. A little glumly, Gohan says that would be great, but as they know, his circumstances are unique, with the closest thing to him being a Kai, and like it or not, he can't afford to spend another year here, since Earth still needs its guardian. Goku agrees, saying such an arrangement would be unsustainable, though maybe this time Gohan doesn't need a mentor who is just like him, he just needs an expert and godly key who can guide him through the best way to harness it, just like when they tried to teach Gohan Super Saiyan as a child. This gives Shin an idea, as he knows someone who is both an expert in godly key, and also experienced in training those who did not always have it on how to use it. And so glad to be of use to his young friend, he tells him to return home and await the arrival of his new master at the lookout. Beaming, Gohan thanks the Supreme Kai, then turns to leave, though before he goes, he asks if there's anything he should do to prepare, and with a grin, Shin replies, ready a feast. Gohan is unsure if this is meant figuratively or literally, but either way, Mr. Popo is happy to help, laying out a sumptuous banquet befitting of Earth's god. Gohan's mouth waters at the sight of all this delicious food, but not wanting to let Shin down when the Kai is doing him a favour, he exerts his self-control not to eat any of it. And it is good that he does, as roughly an hour after returning from the sacred world of the Kais, a tunnel of light appears above the lookout, and from it emerges the angelic attendant Whis. With the sort of laugh one would expect from an arrow aristocratic woman, Whis smiles that Shin did say Gohan was going to give him a treat, but it looks like he really pulled out all the stops. A little confused, Gohan asks if Whis is the mentor Shin told him about, and grinning, the angel replies that he is, explaining that he is also Lord Beerus' martial arts master, but with him napping at the moment, he's agreed to help Gohan get a better handle on his godly form in exchange for tasty food and a chance to observe his unprecedented key. Bowing low, Gohan thanks Whis with the angel replying that it's his pleasure before digging into the feast the young guardian has prepared for him. Watching from the side, Gohan is amazed with how much the skinny being can pack away, his appetite even rivaling that of a Saiyan. And though Gohan is a little saddened that Whis didn't leave anything for him, this is promptly forgotten when the angel floats over to him and between licks of his ice cream cone, asks if he is ready to begin. Gohan nods that he is, though he'd like to make a request. If Whis is already going to be training him in God Key, he'd like to invite his friends as well, since they would also benefit from the training. Whis has no objection to this, agreeing that multiple multiple training partners often facilitates growth, and expressing interest in having at least one other Saiyan as a control group, through which he can compare Gohan's progress. And so having the go-ahead, Gohan reaches out telepathically to the other Z-Warriors, inviting them to the lookout for some training with himself and Whis. Fortunately, Trunks is already here, having stuck around to do some solo training after Gohan got back, and soon the cousins are joined by Raditz and Nappa, both of whom are eager to take part in any sort of training Gohan may have in store for them. It is only now upon seeing him that Gohan remembers his promise to take Nappa to Otherworld, and so greets him somewhat sheepishly, while Raditz informs Whis that they're the only ones coming, having spoken with Tien and Krillin already. 
Weiss nods that he figured as much, and so tells his four new disciples to gather round, since as of right now, their training has begun, and they should be warned, it will be unlike anything they've ever experienced before. And here Weiss is not wrong, being a peculiar master whose training regimen varies from traditional sparring and meditation, to mindless chores, to even journeys into the misty world inside his staff. But each facet of the training has one thing in common, it is all especially gruelling, forcing the Saiyans to give their all at every moment or else fall behind. Nappa laughingly points out to Gohan and Raditz how much this reminds him of their training under Roshi, and just like with that training, their hard work yields results, with the four warriors feeling their strength grow exponentially. However, Gohan is still not satisfied, approaching Whis after dinner one evening to ask how all this is meant to help him control Super Saiyan Rage. Chuckling that he would have thought a deity such as himself would know a little bit more about the value of faith, Whis asks Gohan if he's tried using his transformation since the start of his training. Gohan admits that he hasn't, and with an encouraging nod, the angel tells him to try it. Marshalling his strength, Gohan powers up into his Super Saiyan Rage form, and as the blue core of godly ki settles around him, he feels… normal. Not normal as in the usual hazy mindset that comes with the transformation, but normal in the way he does in his base form. This surprise must be written on Gohan's face, as with a coy smile, Whis asks how Gohan feels. Gohan explains, and the angel laughs that he expected as much, since though Gohan could not see it, all of their exertion training has been for the express purpose of teaching the Saiyans how to consistently output their power at a high level. Such control is essential for mastery of God Ki, as well as the stage of power above that, though he has to admit he's beginning to have his doubts that Gohan will be the one to attain that state of being. Curiously, Gohan asks what power that is, but Whis replies that he should push such questions from his mind, since they are what will stand in the way of attaining it. This doesn't make any sense to Gohan, but having learned his lesson, he doesn't challenge Whis, instead asking what they do now. Smiling, the angelic attendant responds that now it's time for his students to face a more practical test. The next morning, when the Saiyans rise from their beds and assemble in the courtyard to begin the day's training, they are met by Mr. Popo, who tells them that Whis is departed, with instructions for them to wait here and that he should be back in a few hours. Figuring that this must be the test Whis mentioned, Gohan tells the others, with Trunks grinning that he'll ace any test, while Reds and Nappa suggest they use this time to rest, since knowing Whis, when he returns, he'll throw them straight into this new challenge. The younger pair agree, and so it is that when Whis returns a few hours later, he finds the four Saiyans enjoying a picnic. Smiling, Gohan asks his mentor if he'd like to join them, but a gruff voice replies that he'd have thought the designated rival of a destroyer god would be training rather than snacking. That is unless he no longer cares about his world being erased. Recognizing that voice, Gohan gulps, leaping to his feet and bowing as Beerus steps out from behind Whis's back. Trunks, Reddits, and Nappa all do likewise, bowing just as low and welcoming Lord Beerus to their world. Stepping forward, Gohan asks the god what do they owe the pleasure of his return, and curtly Beerus replies that Whis woke him from his nap by promising that he was going to witness a duel between Super Saiyan gods, so whichever one of these three has become a god better get to work, since he's in no mood to be kept waiting. Panicked, Gohan looks at his friends, asking which of them has become a god, but the trio shake their heads, saying they thought only he could do that due to his unique key. Chuckling, Whis replies that he thinks all three of them could actually be quite close to awakening their own godhood, but he did not summon his master to have him watch Gohan fight any of them. In fact, he's only returned here to bring them to their strongest opponent to date. Relief and excitement mingle on the Saiyans' faces, with Gohan asking who they'll be fighting then, but with a wink and a mischievous smile, Whis replies that it's someone they know quite well. Having a hunch who the angel is referring to, Gohan asks if he should just kai kai them there, and nodding at his student's wit, Whis accepts. A few moments later, everyone has a hand on Gohan, and an instant after that, they all vanish. A breeze rolls through the sacred world of the Kais when Gohan and his friends arrive, and as the young guardian surveys the landscape, he finds it remarkably changed, even from his visit just a few months back. Where once there was nothing but plains and the plateaus of nature, now what appears to be a tournament ground has been erected. Standing in the center of a large square fighting ring is Shin, along with Kibito, the Grand Supreme Kai, Goku, and most shockingly of all, Chi Chi. Spotting his mother, Gohan runs up to her, wrapping her in a hug and crying that he's missed her. 
Returning the hug, Chi Chi beams with pride at how her son has grown, smiling that Goku's told her all about what a fine guardian, and more importantly a fine man he's become. Blushing a little, Gohan asks what she's doing here, and Chi Chi replies that the Supreme Kai invited her to watch the tournament. This only raises more questions, and so Gohan turns to Shin, asking what tournament? But it is Goku who answers, smiling that Whis asked him to test the four fighters he's been training. Gohan it seems is a bit apprehensive at this prospect, admitting that while he figured it'd be something like this, he's not sure if he'll be up to the task. But Goku just slugs him on the shoulder, giggling that it'll just be for fun, so Gohan shouldn't worry about it. From behind him an irate Beerus countermands this, saying that if he even suspects Gohan isn't going all out, he'll destroy him and his world. While we sighs that they'll have to forgive Lord Beerus, he always gets cranky after being woken from a nap. Fearing Beerus' power, everyone says this is fine, and so Whis tells them to return to the stands as he explains the rules. At Goku's suggestion, the rules are the same as the World Martial Arts Tournament, with the three ways to lose being Surrender, Ring Out, or KO. Though, since he is dead, Goku is unsure if he can be knocked out. To compensate for this, he will be the entirety of his team, while Gohan, Trunks, Raditz, and Nappa will each be given a chance to try and beat him. With a shiver, Chi Chi grumbles that this is starting to remind her more of the Cell games in the World Martial Arts Tournament, which causes Goku to laugh that he guesses she's right, before adding that he really ought to go pay Cell a visit. Understandably, Chi Chi doesn't take this well, yelling that in case he's forgotten, Cell killed her. Rubbing the back of his head and grinning, Goku replies that he didn't forget, but after the time they spent together in Hell, he knows that Cell isn't really that bad of a guy. From the look Chi Chi gives, everyone wonders whether she'll try to be Goku's first opponent. But cutting this off at the pass, Whis tells his students to decide on their first fighter and have him enter the ring. After some brief deliberation, Nappa says that before they begin, he'd like to forfeit since he knows his limits and Kakarot exceeded them long ago. An evil aura forming around him, Beerus asks just what the bald Saiyan thinks he's pulling depriving him of one of his fights. But Nappa nervously replies that his fight would be too one-sided to be enjoyable to watch. That's why he's stepping aside so they can get onto the real show. Beerus ponders this for a moment, then with a shrug flops down onto a pile of cushions atop one of the stands, saying this is fine so long as someone gets in the ring to fight this Goku character right now. As Beerus Beerus says this, Gohan notices that Trunks has gone pale. In fact, on reflection, the boy's been quiet ever since Beerus arrived on the lookout. Bending down, he asks his cousin if he's okay, but Trunks scoffs that he's fine before scampering off towards the ring. As he goes, Reddits leans in to whisper to his nephew that ever since Bulma's party, Trunks has been having nightmares about Beerus. That's why he's been so focused on pushing his limits, since he never wants to be as helpless as he was during their first encounter. Nodding, Gohan replies that he quite understands the feeling. He just wishes he'd known earlier, since maybe he could have done more to help his cousin through this. Laying a hand on Gohan's shoulder, Reddits thanks him for the thought, but says that no matter how much support they give him, this is something only Trunks can truly save himself from. Stepping into the ring, Trunks greets his uncle with a nod before going straight into Super Saiyan 2, and telling him to transform as well so they can get this fight started. Grinning that he likes Trunks' guts, Goku obliges, going into Super Saiyan 2 as well, but the young man scolds him for holding back, saying that he saw Uncle Kakarot go Super Saiyan 3 against Boo, so he wants to fight him in that form. Looking a little concerned, Goku asks if Trunks is sure, since it might be too much for him to handle, but angrily Trunks protests that he is a Saiyan warrior like his father before him, and the only way he can rise to new heights is by facing the best of the best, so he wants his uncle to come at him with everything he's got. Shrugging, Goku powers up into the long-haired form before swinging a downward hammer blow onto the boy's skull, which sends him crashing into the couch and pavers of the ring. Turning around to face Raditz, he apologizes for doing that to his kid, but he asked for it. But Raditz smirks that this is fine, a grin curling his lips. From his spot beside his uncle, Gohan knows what's amusing Raditz, but before he can warn his dad, a key blast slams into the ex-guardian's back, sending him skidding towards the edge of the ring. With a yelp, Goku flails his arms in an attempt to slow himself down, and by the tips of his tippy toes he manages to hold onto the edge of the ring. Spinning round, he sees a battered but standing Trunks, who smirks that he already told Goku that he's a Saiyan warrior, so he shouldn't count him out. 
Actually getting serious, Goku leaps at Trunks who matches him, going in for a punch. The two fists collide, sending both warriors back, but Trunks has no intention of letting up, springing right back at his uncle. Taking a defensive stance, Goku blocks the hits before kneeing the boy in the gut and following up with a devastating elbow to the face. Nonetheless, Trunks gets up once again, throwing a flurry of blows at any inch of Goku he can lay his hands on. However, for all his spunk, Trunks simply does not have the power to match Goku, and so for every 10 hits Trunks stalls out, Goku only needs one to do as much damage to a body far less equipped to take it. And so before long the inevitable happens, with Trunks fatiguing while his uncle stays strong. Goku for his part is proud of the boy, telling him as much, and thanking him for such a fun fight. But Trunks will not hear it, screaming that how dare his uncle act as though this battle is already over, before channeling all his strength into one last flying kick. Goku copies his nephew, and as the duo saw at each other, the ex-guardian knows exactly what is going to happen moments before it does. From the stands, everyone watches as Trunks and Goku collide, though only one of their attacks manages to hit, and when both fall, Trunks is unconscious, having been kicked in the face while his short leg failed to make contact with his uncle. Picking the young man up, Goku floats over to the stands and lowers him gently onto a seat, while tears of pride will in Raditz's eyes as he tells his son what a good job he did, before promising to finish things. He then meets his brother's eyes, and with a fierce grin declares that he will be Kakarot's next and last opponent. Grinning in turn, Goku replies that he hopes Raditz can back up those words before the two brothers fly back to the ring. Due to his infinite energy engine taking away the primary floor of this form, Raditz is already in Super Saiyan 3, having rarely left it since the fight with Boo. And with Goku also in the form, there is no need for preamble. As one, the brothers lunge at each other like wild beasts, hands raised and faces contorted into fearsome glares. Goku has the slight edge when it comes to speed and this allows him to strike first, driving a fist into Raditz's stomach before following up with a chop to the crown of the head. This sends Raditz crashing onto his back, but ever the pragmatist, the elder son of Bardock uses this to deliver a brutal two-foot kick to Goku's solar plexus, winding him temporarily. This moment of vulnerability is all Raditz needs, launching himself upwards and headbutting the underside of his little brother's chin. As the younger Saiyan staggers backwards, he howls that this was a dirty trick that made him bite his tongue. But grinning maliciously, Raditz retorts that all's fair in love and war before running in for a lariat. Shrugging off the pain, Goku grins that if that's how Raditz wants to play things, so be it, before striking out with two fingers to poke his brother in the eyes. With a howl, Raditz falls on his back once more, negating the lariat, and so Goku lines up a kick to send him out of the ring. However, this is a trap as Raditz rolls out of the way, causing Goku to trip and thus allowing the long-haired Saiyan to grab his leg. Shooting up into the air, Raditz spins, hurling Goku at a nearby mesa, but never one to go down easy, Goku regains control of himself in mid-air, zooming around the rocky outcrop before coming back into view with an arm extended for a punch. This hits hard against Raditz's jaw, causing blood to spurt from his mouth. But this is a small price to pay, as the long-haired Saiyan executes the same trick he did during his spa with Gohan on the day of Bulma's party. Grabbing hold of Goku's fist, the older brother then pulls him in, grappling the ex-guardian and trapping him in a full Nelson. Naturally, Goku attempts to break free, but Raditz being a bigger and bulkier man is able to keep his grip, as he does a loop-de-loop -loop in mid-air before charging headlong at the ground outside the ring. Astonished, Goku demands to know what his brother is thinking, but Raditz just cackles that he's going to avenge Trunks his loss, even if it means taking himself out with Goku. By now the ground is getting very close, and knowing that unless he thinks of something fast, he'll be eliminated from this tawny, Goku makes one last desperate play, putting all his weight into his shoulder and slamming it back into Raditz. Having already assumed his victory, this takes Raditz by surprise, knocking him slightly off course so that now instead of Goku being the one on the bottom, he is. Apologizing for the dirty trick, Goku then puts his feet together, using them to fire off a Kamehameha into the Sky, which further accelerates their descent, causing Raditz to slam back first into the dirt before he can flip over again. Letting out a sigh, Raditz releases his hold on his little brother, saying that was quite a devious tactic, with Goku giggling that he must have picked up a few tricks from Raditz along the way. He then adds that it was a great fight, and he's really impressed by how far Raditz has come, however he just couldn't afford to lose to him, not when he knows who his final opponent will be. This is Gohan's cue, and so as Goku floats back into the ring, and Nappa helps Raditz back to the stands, the young guardian steps up to fight at last. 
Meanwhile, from the other side of the stands, Chi Chi cheers for Gohan, yelling that she knows he'll do great. A little hurt, Goku complains that shouldn't she be cheering for him too since she's his wife? But waspishly, Chi Chi retorts that she's Gohan's mother first and foremost, before cheering for her son once more. Eyeing each other up, Goku comments that his son is really all grown up, with Gohan nodding that he's about the same age as his dad was when he died. Smiling, Goku replies that luckily Gohan's still got plenty of life left to live, before powering up once more into Super Saiyan 3. Gohan in turn enters Super Saiyan Rage, and on Whis's call, the duo fly at each other. Like when Gohan was younger, the first stage of their battle is just a warm-up, with both parties trading a few blows to get a gauge of where the other is at. To Gohan's surprise, from what he gathers in this exchange, he is far beyond his father's level. As the pair split apart, Goku even comments on this, saying Gohan must have been working really hard to already have him on the ropes. Gohan nods that he's been doing his best, then vanishes, reappearing at Goku's side and delivering a spin kick to his father's ribs, which sends him rocketing towards the stand. Using all his strength, Goku is barely able to pull up at the last second, soaring into the air and surveying Gohan from above. Gohan, however, has no intention of staying passive, and so shoots up after his dad, aiming an uppercut at his father's gut. Once more, Goku only just barely avoids calamity, dodging by the skin of his teeth, but at such close range, there is no dodging the elbow that Gohan thrusts backwards as he passes. This connects with the ex-guardian and sends him crashing back into the ring while his successor gently floats down behind him. Forcing himself back onto his feet, Goku admits that he's impressed. He'd always dreamed of the day Gohan would be his ultimate rival, but he never imagined it would be so soon. Very well, time to pull out his ace in the hole. Suddenly, Goku drops back to his base form and Gohan wonders what his dad is doing until a fiery red aura begins to coat him. As this aura bursts into life, it dyes Goku's hair and eyes the same shade of red, while his Kai attire seems to grow baggy, as if he has rapidly lost weight. It is an odd transformation, but one that Gohan can feel is radiating with power, and so with awe in his voice, he asks what this new form is. Goku admits that he doesn't know, though from what he's gathered, it's a result of training alongside the Kais for so long, since it allows him to properly make use of God Key, just like Super Saiyan Rage does for Gohan. Smiling, Gohan says it's great that his dad unlocked this, before adding that he thinks he has just the name for it, Super Saiyan God. Goku grins that he likes it, then asks his son if he wants to know which of their forms is superior, to which Gohan grins that he took the words right out of his mouth. Quick as a flash, the battle resumes, though this time it is far more even, with Goku's Super Saiyan God state closing the gap between himself and Gohan. Gohan, however, isn't complaining, glad to be able to fight against his dad as an equal, and so the name of the game changes, no longer being a test of power, but instead becoming a test of skill, with both going all out as a testament to the respect they hold for each other. Goku is the first to strike, using his now lither build to move in quicker and drive a fist into his son's gut, which sends the younger man flying. However, Gohan won't go down so easily, breaking in mid-air before coming in for a rib to the knees. Pouncing backwards, Goku lays down a Key Blast volley as suppressing fire, but Gohan is able to bat these aside as he closes in, executing the very lariat Raditz was unable to. As the pair crash to the ground, Goku executes a flawless bicycle kick, which strikes the back of Gohan's head, sending him face first into the kitchen with a nasty crunch. A worried murmur runs through the onlookers, but as Goku sits up, he tells them not to worry, since he knows Gohan still has plenty of fight left in him. And this is promptly proven right, as the young guardian rolls onto his back and uses a point-blank solar flare to blind his opponent. He then goes in for a surprise punch, but this is caught by Goku, who tuts that he can sense godly energy too, remember? He then opens fire on Gohan, launching a key ball into the younger Saiyan's stomach, which sends him flying, before vanishing and reappearing above him, aiming a kick which will slam Gohan into the dirt and end this match by ring out. However, just before this kick can connect, Gohan kaikais away, coming back into view on the far side of the ring. With a smile, he tells his dad that it seems they really are evenly matched, both in strength and martial arts ability, meaning there's only one thing left to be a tiebreaker, a beam struggle. Grinning, Goku replies that he was just thinking the same thing, and so floats to the other side of the ring, before charging up his Kamehameha. Gohan does likewise, and in unison the father-son duo let out a pair of mighty cries as they fire their beams. In a flash of blue, the two beams clash, and just as with everything else, it seems Goku and Gohan are evenly matched. 
In the stands, no one breathes as if the slightest breeze could tip the scale one way or the other. But in the end, it is a scream rather than a breath that ends things, as Goku and Gohan each marshal the last of their strength for one last push. The explosion that follows rocks the entire solar system, and as Goku and Gohan come back into view, lying among the rubble of the now destroyed ring, Goku giggles that he thinks they went a little overboard. Laughing, Gohan agrees, and so reaching out a hand to touch his father, thanks him for such an incredible fight. From the sideline, Whis smiles that this match is a draw, while the Saiyans' friends and family rush the field to check on them and congratulate the pair for an amazing effort. After some healing from Nappa, the Grand Supreme Kai invites everyone to a celebratory feast to commend the brave warriors who fought today. Beerus snaps that there better not be any of that gross South Galaxy fish the rotund Kai served him last time, or he'll seal him in a sword like his predecessor. But nonetheless, he and Whis do attend, with the event being a joyous one that stretches late into the night. However, it does eventually come time to go home, and so Raditz, Trunks, and Nappa make their goodbyes, thanking the Kais for their hospitality and this chance to test themselves before heading over to join Beerus and Whis. But it quickly becomes apparent that one among their number is missing, Gohan. Looking high and low for the young man, Raditz soon finds him sitting on a mesa that once held the Z-Sword. However, he is not alone, as seated on either side of him are Goku and Chi-Chi, each holding one of their son's hands as they look up at the stars. None of them say a word, simply enjoying this chance to be together, and not wanting to disturb this, Raditz signals for Trunks and Nappa to return to Whis and tell him they'll be leaving without Gohan. Looking confused, Trunks asks his father why they'd do this, but Raditz just smiles fondly that after all he's gone through, Gohan deserves this. In the eternal gloom cast over the city, Trunks runs from building to building, unwilling even to fly for fear of giving off the smallest energy signature. Thankfully, this is not an issue for the man he's trying to reach, and so as the hulking figure of Android 16 throws open the door to their safe house, the now adult Trunks leaps inside, his heart rate finally starting to slow a little at the sight of his loved ones. Worry on her face, Bulma rushes over, asking if her son is alright, but Trunks replies that he's fine before asking the same of her. Bulma smiles that Sixteen has kept her safe, and the android beams with pride, while Trunks looks up at his best friend, thanking him for his efforts. Sixteen nods that he is indebted to him for giving him a second chance at life, so he will put it to use protecting the brief family from anything that might harm them. A sense of heavy tension sets in at this allusion to their new enemy, and so knowing they have no time to waste, Bulma tells Sixteen to bring out the fuel, with the droid nodding once, before opening his chest cavity to reveal a canister of blue fluid. Trunks thanks his mum, promising that they'll be back in no time at all, before sprinting back out the door this time with Sixteen at his heels. Looking around, Trunks can't help but mourn, remembering all the effort he, his mum and Sixteen put into rebuilding this city, only to see it reduced to ruins once more, though he reminds himself that if all goes as planned, the danger will soon be over and they can rebuild once again. Finding a patch of ground unobscured by rubble, Trunks tosses the capsule for the time machine, and as it bursts to life, Sixteen loads up the fuel. The dark-haired savior then clambers into the cockpit, beginning the launch sequence, while Sixteen begins his own takeoff preparation by grabbing hold of one of the time machine's legs and trusting his mechanical grip will not fail him in the time stream. Everything is going according to plan. That is until a cruel, tittering laugh fills the hero's ears. Looking round, they quickly spot him, standing atop one of the few buildings to have survived his rampage. And as their eyes meet, the monster sneers, asking if Trunks and Sixteen are running away in their little aircraft. He then fires a blast, clearly intended to shatter the cockpit, but it is intercepted by one of Sixteen's rocket-powered fists, which takes the hit in Trunks' stead, though is tragically disintegrated in the process. Letting go of the time machine with his remaining hand, Sixteen growls that he isn't going anywhere, and that Black's reign of terror ends today. Frantically, Trunks demands to know what his friend is doing as he raises to pop the hatch and join him back on the ground, but before he can, Sixteen tells the hybrid to stop, reminding him of the mission. This seems to interest Black, who cockily asks what mission that might be, but cold as the steel that made him, Sixteen replies that he need not concern himself with that, since right now all he should be focusing on is fighting him. Trunks protests that even with all his upgrades, Sixteen won't stand a chance against Black, but the one-armed android grunts this doesn't matter, since he will fight his hardest, and even if he falls, he will die proudly knowing he has protected his family. 
tears run down Trunks' face now, and as the time machine begins to lift into the air, he screams that Sixteen doesn't have to do this, but with a wiry grin, Sixteen replies that he does. After all, how can he pass up the chance to protect those precious to him while also fulfilling his original objective, to kill Son Goku? Behind Black, lightning strikes, revealing Goku's stolen face. And as the dark doppelganger leaps down, so does Sixteen fly up, clashing in mid-air. Moments later, Trunks and the Time Machine vanish in a flash of light, and though there is still a hard fight ahead of him, Sixteen smiles to know that his friend is safe. He then turns his attention to Black, swinging his remaining fist to the pseudo-Saiyan's face. However, Black is faster, grabbing him by the wrist and crushing down with enough force to buckle pure metal. Though this doesn't bother Sixteen, who just as quickly detaches the limb, and now with two exposed arm cannons, fires a point-blank hell's flash at Black's face. For all his bravado, this catches the doppelganger off guard, sending him flying back into the building that he was standing on, as Sixteen reappears in front of him and knees him in the stomach. This actually makes Black spit up, a disgustingly mortal act which only infuriates him more, causing him to lay into the android with a flurry of blows that drive him back. This is followed up by an aerial roundhouse kick, which sends the ginger droid into the dirt, and as he attempts to rise, Black lands atop his prey, stomping down on his head. Despite this damage, Sixteen taunts that Black doesn't learn from his mistakes, raising his arms and attempting to blast him with a second Hell's Flash. However, knowing what the move is now, the monster is able to dodge this time. This does at least give Sixteen a chance to get back to his feet, and as he reattaches his discarded arm, he bellows at Black to come out and face him. Sneeringly, Black calls this the bestial brutality of mortals on full display, and the proof if ever he needed it that the cosmos would be better off without them. He then reappears not far from Sixteen, and fires off a Kamehameha, though this is not the clear blue of its normal form, but rather purplish black and radiating malefic key. At such close range, Sixteen cannot avoid the attack, losing his arm and much of his chest in the blast. Thankfully, it is not the arm that still possesses a hand, and so lunging forward, he wraps the damaged appendage around Black's throat, declaring that it seems he is now destined to leave this world, but he will not be going alone. Through the whole Black Maiden 16's side, lights begin to flicker, counting down his self-destruct sequence, and though the devious doppelganger tries to break free, 16 is able to keep his grip. Soon the time rent is its final stretch, and with pride in his voice, Sixteen declares that Black's evil days are done, before beginning to count down the last few seconds. As he does this, Black gives up on his frantic bid to escape, his face becoming almost serene, and Sixteen wonders if he has accepted the inevitability of his end. However, this is not the case, as moments later a blade of key bursts through Sixteen's chest, destroying the timer and leaving the bomb inert. Looking down, Sixteen sees that it is the same sinister key as the Kamehameha, though he is not left to wander at the source for long, as they quickly retract the blade through his back, before giving two more swift slices, one at his wrist to free Black, and the other through his neck so that his head clatters to the floor. From the ground, Sixteen sees the newcomer's face, and it is the last person he would have expected. Dressed head to toe in the same grand black garb as the imposter Goku is an adult Gohan. Clearing his throat after having it grappled, Goku Black thanks his ally for his assistance, with Gohan Black saying it was his pleasure, though he was surprised to see him struggling against this inferior machine. Scorn in his voice, Goku Black replies that it has its share of base cunning, so his partner should be careful. But Gohan Black smirks that of course it has cunning. It is an abomination of the highest order, a facsimile of life created by mortals so they may mimic the gods. Angrily, Sixteen barks that he may be artificial, but his life is real. He has known the pride of achievement, the pain of loss, and the love of his family just like any other man, so how dare these imposters call him a fake? Fury burns in the two dark-clad figures' faces at this, though their voices remain low and haughty as they declare that they are not imposters, they are gods, so it is their right and their right alone to judge. To contradict their will is to sin, and for the myriad of sins Sixteen has committed, he will be justly punished. Glaring up at them, Sixteen retorts that they can do whatever they want to him. Soon Trunks will return more powerful than ever. However, instead of showing any fear at this declaration, Goku Black merely smiles that they're counting on it, before he and his comrade turn their godly wrath on the unarmed android. Meanwhile, in another timeline, another Trunks is facing a Goku-related problem of his own. However, it is not one of survival, but rather of pride. Ever since his uncle Kakarot showed off Super Saiyan God during the tournament on the Supreme Kai's world, Trunks has been working around the clock to attain it for himself. 
knowing that it is the next step on his path to becoming the strongest. Unfortunately, every attempt so far has been a failure, and while this normally would not bother the teen, his father and Nappa have had no such trouble unlocking it, and with Gohan having a Super Saiyan Rage form, this means he's the only Saiyan without Godly Key. And to make matters worse, it seems that no one can help him resolve this problem, as each of the people who would usually turn to have some sort of impediment that stops them from teaching him. For Whis, it is that he's returned to Beerus's planet. And though he said this is because he believes the Sands would benefit from some self-directed learning, in truth it is at Beerus's command. Since with so many godly Saiyans popping up, the Destroyer God feels that he is in need of some extra training, just to make sure he is still the top cat. His dad also can't help, since he is still a relative novice in the ways of Godly Key, barely being able to control it, let alone teach someone else how to use it. Gohan does not have this particular problem, though ever since returning from the secret world of the Kais, he's been acting… weird. And more than once, Trunks has caught him kai kai off the lookout at night and not returning until the wee hours of the morning. Not sure what to do, Trunks turns to the last of his mentors, who in spite of his lack of god key, can at least offer practical advice. And that is Tien. Tien's solution as with everything is to keep training rigorously, though when this fails to yield results, he does add an addendum. Why not study the form alongside its originator, Goku? Trunks admits that he hadn't thought of asking Uncle Kakarot for help, but figures it couldn't hurt, so knowing that his best way to get to the other world without dying is Gohan, lays a trap to ensure his cousin will take him. Staking out the Guardian's chambers one evening after another day of training on the lookout, he hears the telltale sign of Kai Kai, and so takes a seat on Gohan's bed, waiting for his return. As expected, Gohan doesn't return until nearly 3am, but having braced himself for the long haul, Trunks is still awake, and so makes an accusatory sound when his cousin appears back in his room. Jumping, Gohan asks what the boy is doing here, and with an evil grin, Trunks replies that he was waiting for Gohan to come back from… you know… Sweating bullets, Gohan asks if Trunks really knows about that, and with the casual bluff of a master gambler, Trunks replies that of course he does. After all, it's not like Gohan's being all that subtle. Gulping, Gohan cries that he knew it, but before he can ramble on, Trunks cuts him off, saying he could be convinced not to tell everyone if Gohan does him a little favor. Still looking panicked, Gohan asks what the favor is, and with that grin still plastered on his face, the son of Reddit's answers that he wants his cousin to take him to the Supreme Kai's world in the morning. Sighing with relief that this is all Trunks wants, Gohan happily agrees, promising to take him so long as Trunks keeps his mouth shut about this. The next morning the pair set off bright and early, and when they arrive on the sacred world of the Kais, Goku greets them as though he'd been expecting them. This catches Gohan off guard, asking his dad what's going on, but Goku replies that he thought they were here to come with them to Universe 10 for his fight. With a hint of sternness, Kabito reminds Goku that this isn't a fight, it's a friendly sparring match so he shouldn't go overboard, but Goku shrugs that they'll just have to see how strong the Zamasu guy is. After all, it's not every day he gets invited to fight one of the strongest gods of another universe. Piecing together the situation from context clues, Trunks' eyes go wide, and he declares that he definitely wants to come along, since having two uses of God Key will be of great use to him. Beaming, Goku says the more the merrier, before asking if Gohan's coming too, though with a slight shake of his head, the young guardian declines, saying that he has to get back to the lookout, but he'll be cheering for his dad. He then Kai Kai's away, and not long after Shin and the Grand Supreme Kai join Goku, Trunks and Kibito, so they can do the same. To Trunks' eye, it appears as though the colour of the sky has suddenly changed, since the area he reappears in is shockingly similar to the one he just left, with the only key difference being the sky is yellow instead of pink. Waiting to greet the Universe 7 procession are two figures, both Kai's from their appearance and clothes, one of whom is elderly with yellow skin, while the other is green-skinned and youthful. The latter of the pair bows to the newcomers, welcoming them to Universe 10's Sacred World of the Kai's, and introducing himself as Zamasu, and his master is Goasu. Anything more the young Kai might have to say is then cut off by Goku, who exuberantly introduces himself, before sticking out a hand to shake. For the briefest moment, Zamasu regards the hand as though it was something repellent and filthy, but in an instant this disdain is gone, and he smiles as he placidly shakes hands with Goku, saying he saw his battle with the other Saiyans on Godtube. He then looks at Trunks, 
who thanks to a recent growth spurt is roughly on par with the Kai in terms of height, and expresses admiration for how diligently he fought during the first round of the tournament. Trunks rubs the back of his head and grins that it was nothing, before saying he's currently working to surpass his limits and even unlock the god form his uncle used. This makes Zamasu choke a little, but after recovering himself, he nods that he supposes mortals wouldn't be mortals if they didn't have that burning drive to be more than they are. He then asks Goku if he is ready for their spa, and grinning broadly, Goku replies that he is, before taking his fighting stance. As Zamasu does likewise, Trunks and the remaining Kai's back up to give them space, and on Goasu's command, the match begins. The two fighters then lunge at each other, with Zamasu using his key to turn his chops into blades of pure energy. As one of these leaves a gash on Goku's cheek, the Saiyan grins that he better turn up the heat, transforming into Super Saiyan to try and level the playing field. However, even this is not enough, as Zamasu manages to dodge the hit he throws in return before delivering another cut up Goku's arm. Jumping up to Super Saiyan 2, Goku finally manages to match Zamasu, with both giving and receiving a roughly equal number of blows. Smiling, Goku says he sees why Zamasu is so well regarded, since not many people can keep up with him in Super Saiyan 2, but with a sigh, Zamasu replies that he knows Goku's holding back, so please come at him with his Super Saiyan God form. From the sidelines, Trunks beams, having hoped he'd get to see this, and he is not disappointed as Uncle Kakarot's hair returns to its normal shape, though with that crimson coloration. He then launches himself at Zamasu, and it is no contest, with his punch easily breaking through the Kai's guard and sending him flying to a nearby tree, which shatters into splinters with the force of the impact. Giggling self-consciously, Goku admits that maybe this was what Kibito was warning him about, much to the Pink Kai's frustration. While from the ground, Zamasu marvels that a mortal could surpass a god so effortlessly. Bending down to help the apprentice Kai to his feet, Goku grins that he's not the only one, since his son Gohan is just as strong as he is, while if he were to guess, he'd say Zamasu is about equal with Trunks when it comes to power. This makes the heir to Capsule Corp smile, while a slight frown crosses Zamasu's face as he vows to get stronger. Seeing that their goals are one and the same, Trunks offers to spar with him next, but rubbing his back, the green-skinned Kai says that he'll have to take a rain check after that last fight, suggesting that instead they might all retire to Goasu's mana for some tea. Shin and the Grand Supreme Kai call this a wonderful idea, and so they depart, albeit with a slightly dejected Trunks. After a few hours of friendly conversation but no more sparring, it comes time to go, though not before Trunks extracts a promise out of Goasu to be allowed to return in the near future so he may test his medal against Zamasu. Goasu smilingly calls this a promising attitude, and so offers Trunks to return any time he pleases, much to Zamasu's displeasure, though the green-skinned Kai does mostly manage to conceal this. It is only when their guests from the Seventh are gone that he lightly chides his master, asking what he was thinking letting mortals onto the sacred world, let alone inviting them back. Sighing as though this is an old fight, Goasu admonishes Zamasu's dislike for mortals before bidding him to think deeply on this prejudice, as it may one day do him great harm as a Supreme Kai. Back in Universe 7, Trunks is returned to the lookout by Goku, who promises to give him some Super Saiyan God training tomorrow, and this does manage to lift his somewhat gloomy mood. However, any thoughts of tomorrow are promptly pushed to the side as Trunks takes note of the odd state the lookout is in. It's completely deserted, with even Gohan being gone, despite his claims of needing to stay home and work. A little worried, the boy seeks out Mr. Popo, who tells him that Gohan along with Raditz and Nappa were called to Capsule Corp on seemingly urgent business. Assuming this must be some world-ending threat, Trunks takes off at top speed towards his home, though when he spots his friends and family, they aren't fighting. Instead, they're gathered around an unconscious figure, while a weird-looking spaceship is parked on the front lawn. Rushing over, Trunks asks what's happened, though he can hardly believe his eyes when he sees who everyone is gathered around. It's him. As if he had been waiting for Trunks to arrive, the other Trunks' eyes flicker open and he gasps in shock, demanding to know where someone called Black is. Soothingly, Bulma tells the elder Trunks that there's no one by that name here and that he's back in the past. This causes Trunks to stop panting and finally survey everyone. With each face, his smile only grows, hugging his past parents and wondering at how much Gohan has grown. Finally, his eyes fall on his present counterpart, and for all the different circumstances that made up their upbringing, they both have the same reaction, 
Stunned silence. Being the bolder of the pair, the younger Trunks speaks first, asking if this version of him is the one his dad told him about. The guy from the future whose world was wrecked by androids. The future version of Trunks nods, saying that unfortunately that is why he came back. A new threat has arisen to ravage his timeline, and he isn't strong enough to stop it on his own. Nodding, Raditz asks if it's Boo, but Future Trunks shakes his head, saying that he beat Boo a while back. Note the one destroying his timeline now is Goku. Sounding troubled, Gohan asks how that's possible, since he thought his dad still died against Frieza in the future timeline, and Future Trunks says that he did, which is why it's so puzzling. Nappa points out that most low-class Saiyans do look alike, so maybe it's just a rogue Saiyan from before the destruction of Planet Vegeta, but Future Trunks shakes his head, saying that this person dresses like Goku, and even used the name Goku to lull everyone to a false sense of security before starting his rampage. However, since they know Goku would never do something like this, he, his mother, and Android 16 have taken to calling this mystery assailant Black, as to not besmirch the Fallen Guardian's name. Looking very serious at the thought of anyone tarnishing his dad's reputation, Gohan promises that he will help Future Trunks get to the bottom of this and defeat Black, while beside him, the rest of the Z Fighters including present Trunks nod their agreement. From above them, a supercilious voice cackles that it's adorable how Trunks thinks gathering more worthless mortals will actually change God's judgement. And as all eyes turn to the sky, they see what Future Trunks was talking about. Goku, but emanating an aura of purest evil. However, he is not alone, as from behind him floats a second figure, Gohan Black, and the sight of these two sets the real Gohan's blood to boil. Without thought or strategy, he jumps up, throwing himself at the invaders, and Goku Black mocks his comrade, saying he really became an awful brute. But before he can elaborate, present Gohan's fist connects with his mouth, sending blood spurting everywhere. Furiously, Goku Black demands to know how dare this filthy mortal mar his divine features. But Gohan doesn't bother answering, instead powering up into Super Saiyan rage and continuing his onslaught much to the imposter's horror. Down below the Z-Warriors watch on, wondering if this is really the great terror future Trunks spoke of. However, Trunks himself only has eyes for Gohan Black, having never seen him before. Noticing this attention, Gohan Black lands softly before them, sneering they all look like they've seen a ghost, while Future Trunks asks if he's with Black. Coldly, Gohan Black scowls that that is the same name Trunks' android friend calls his compatriot. How utterly primitive. But yes, they are allies. He then adds that speaking of the android, he has a gift from him, before pulling out the hard drive that contains 16's memories and personality. Future Trunks doesn't have to ask how the sadistic pseudo Sand got that, and so instead coldly orders him to hand it over now. But with a cruel laugh, Gohan Black says that isn't the gift. The gift is a message, that if he continues to stand in their way, he will end up just like this machine. Then, quick as a flash, he crushes the drive in his hand, destroying any hope of the heroic android being revived. Roaring in fury, Future Trunks ignites his key sword and runs at Gohan Black. But sidestepping the swing, the invader taunts that he is not here to fight. He simply came to deliver the message. However, since this brat won't take the hint, he'll have to force the issue. He then raises a hand, firing off a small orb of key. But instead of hitting any of the heroes, it instead strikes the time machine, turning it to dust. This draws everyone's eyes, and as Goku Black uses this opportunity to extract himself from Gohan's beating, Gohan Black tells him it's time to go. For a moment it looks like the Goku imposter will refuse, a clear bloodlust in his eyes. But when he sees the steely determination on his partner's face, he acquiesces, raising the index finger on his right hand and creating a portal for them both to flee through. As this portal dissipates, so does Trunks' only way home, leaving him marooned in the past, while his own timeline is completely at the mercy of Goku and Gohan Black. The flaming wreckage of the time machine reflects in the eyes of future Trunks, and as Gohan, Bulma, Raditz, and present Trunks approach the long-haired man, it is plain to see from his tortured expression that a piece of him is burning with it. Tenderly, Raditz lays a hand on his future son's shoulder, promising they'll find a way through this. While in a more pragmatic tone, Bulma states that she's already figured out how. She's going to reverse engineer the time machine from the parts here. Sighing, future Trunks thanks his mother, but says that's easier said than done, as it took him and future Bulma years to perfect the time machine 
machine, and they don't have that long with the two villains running wild in his timeline. However, instead of sharing her son's gloomy outlook, Bulma retorts that it took them years in an apocalyptic world while they were constantly on the run from androids. Here she has plentiful resources and the advantage of not needing to build the machine from scratch, so it should take her far less time. Though, and here her sunny optimism does falter a little, being replaced by a consoling tone, it will still take some time, so for the moment, future trunks will have to sit tight. This clearly upsets the future dweller who scowls, though he is at least emotionally intelligent enough not to lash out. Wanting to help too, Gohan offers to let Trunks stay at the lookout with him, saying they've got a lot of catching up to do, but eagerly, present Trunks cuts him off, saying his future counterpart should stay with them, since he wants to get to know the badass swordsman his dad's always talking about. This makes future Trunks blush, as he says that he'd hate to be in imposition, but with a smile back on her face, Bulma says she insists, saying she'll even have a capsule house made up for him, so he can stay for as long as he likes. All this hospitality clearly flusters Trunks, though it does at least get his mind off the precarious position his own world is in, and seeing this, his present version begins pulling him inside, urging him to explain how he beat Boo, since in this timeline it took the whole team to take that monster down. Wanting to hear this as well, Gohan, Raditz, Nappa, Tien, and Krillin follow behind the two Trunkses, while Bulma departs to her lab, ordering two workers to bring the debris. When they are all inside, Future Trunks recounts the events of his battle with Boo, explaining how he and Six were recruited by his timeline's Shin Kibito and Elder Kai. At this point, Nap interjects, asking if by Elder Kai, Trunks means the Grand Supreme Kai, giving the young man a brief descriptor of the rotund and jolly Kai. However, Trunks shakes his head, saying that maybe he just lost a lot of weight, but the person he met wasn't like what Nappa described at all. He was old, shriveled, and cranky, having apparently spent eons trapped in the Z Sword before Goku and Gohan broke it during their training. At this statement, Gohan goggles, admitting that he doesn't know what's wild that there's a Kai living in the Z Sword, or that he and his dad stayed on the sacred world of the Kais for that long. Smiling, Future Trunks nods that he actually got to meet the future father and son, and even trained with them for a while after Elder Kai granted him a new power-up. Now it is Raditz's turn to interrupt, eagerly asking what kind of new power-up, but before his future son can answer, the younger Trunks cuts in, telling everyone to knock it off with the questions, since he wants to hear the whole story. This makes everyone sweat drop, most of all future Trunks who can't help but nurse the stark difference in demeanor between himself and his past counterpart. Nonetheless, he elaborates that he and Sixteen trained for all in the sacred world, while Shin and Kibito tracked down Barbie and his minions, at which point the four of them departed to stop the ancient evil from being awoken. Unfortunately, Goku and Gohan couldn't go with them, as with Fortune Teller Baba did at the hands of the androids, no one was around to enact their one day passes. At the wizard's spaceship, Trunks, Kibito, and Sixteen did battle with Babidi's champions, Deborah, Pui Pui, and Yakon, and though the villains were no match for their might, when Trunks demonstrated his new power against Debora, the key output was enough to awaken Margin Boo. Nobly, Kibito sacrificed his life in an attempt to destroy Boo, but when this failed, it fell to Trunks and Sixteen to end the nightmare with combined double Sunday. Though sadly not before Shin was killed by Boo. Since then he's done his best to honor his fallen comrades by maintaining order and watching over the world. However, all hope of a peaceful world died when Goku Black turned up. Worriedly, Gohan ponders whether perhaps he and Gohan Black could be the future versions of himself and his dad that Trunks met during his training for Boo, but Trunks shakes his head, saying that's impossible, since the Gohan he met was still the same age as when he died against Frieza, and as they all saw, Gohan Black is comparable in age to present Gohan. Not to mention he has the scars in his arms that Gohan got during the Cell games which never happened in his timeline. This does relieve Gohan somewhat, not wanting to believe any version of himself or his dad could become evil, but this still means the identity of the future invaders remains a mystery. Setting his jaw, the Guardian promises that while Bulma works on the time machine, he'll do some digging to see if he can find any clues. And considering how Goku Black called himself God, his first port of call will be Shin. The next morning, Gohan returns to the sacred world of the Kais for the second time in as many days, though this time with Krillin by his side rather than Trunks. Having been disturbed by the idea of a villain wearing his fallen best friend's face, Krillin had volunteered to assist Gohan in his investigation, with the young hybrid being happy to accept the help. However, when the pair reach Shin's world, they are not met by the kindly deity, but rather a testy Kibito. Adopting a non-confrontational tone, Gohan asks if he can see the Supreme Kai, but this is promptly rebuffed, with a pink skinned god huffing that Lord Shin is busy. A moment later, Kibito thinks better of his rudeness and apologizes, explaining that the Supreme Kai and Goku were called to Lord Zeno's palace to discuss yesterday's sparring match. 
At these last three words, Kibito's calm begins to crack, with an undertone of fretfulness making its way into his speech. A fact not made any easier by Krillin, who asks who Lord Zeno is. Pacing now, Kibito tells the human that Lord Zeno is the ruler of all reality with the power to erase whole universes in the blink of an eye. This rightfully scares Krillin, but Kibito isn't done, saying that if his suspicions are correct, his master and Goku have been summoned so they can be punished for allowing a model to cross universes, since why else would the Omni King call for them? Not Gravely, Gohan promises to provide any help he can, but with a heavy sigh, Kibito states that he very much doubts Gohan can do anything. He then asks why the young man and his friend wanted to see Lord Shin, and when Gohan finishes explaining, Kibito's jaw hangs slack and his eyes look like they're about to pop out of his head. With a furious roar, he curses that of course these mortals would commit the forbidden act of time travel, right when Lord Zeno's eye will already be upon them. But in a placating tone, Gohan tells the pink-skinned Kai not to worry, since this isn't Trunks' first time coming here, and nothing bad happened. Well, except for the whole thing with Cell. But they sorted that out pretty quickly. By now, all the veins in Kibito's forehead are pulsing, and in a voice that suggests he's only holding onto his sanity by a very tenuous sliver, he urges Gohan to get rid of future trunks as soon as he can, since if by some miracle the Omni King does not erase them for yesterday's transgression, he certainly will if he learns they're harboring a time traveler. Having spent a year training with Kibito, during which time the Kai didn't like him or his father very much, Gohan is used to sensing frustration in Kibito's energy. But something about this outburst troubles the young half Saiyan, though he can't put his finger on why. However, now is hardly the time to investigate it, as he fears that if he adds to Kibito's stress any further, he might kill over and die. And with him already being dead, having given up his life to revive Gohan, this would be disastrous. And so it is that Gohan and Krillin bid farewell to the attendant, having no further business on the sacred world, with the two people they wish to speak to being absent. When they're alone, Krillin asks if they're going to enter Beerus' world next, since he's the other god they know, but to his surprise Gohan says no, stating that he's still not sure whether they can trust the destroyer god. In all honesty, part of him suspects that Gohan Black might actually be Beerus, since he definitely recognized the imposter's key, and Black's actions certainly fall within Beerus's modus operandi. After all, it's all there in the name, God of Destruction. Shuddering at the thought, Krillin asks if Gohan knows how Beerus would be able to impersonate him, but here the young guardian admits that he doesn't have a clue, but that's something they'll need to figure out out if they're to stand any chance of defeating him. Meanwhile, back at Capsule Corp, the two Trunks have spent a very enjoyable morning together, playing Capsule Cart and eating ice cream. Though no fan of that infernal game, especially when the boys decide to team up against him, Reddits does join them, and it does his synthetic heart good to see these versions of his son getting along like long-lost brothers. However, it doesn't mean he's about to let them lounge around like a pair of slugs all day. And so after a sumptuous lunch courtesy of Capsule Corp's kitchen staff, he tells the boys that if they're going to be battling evil versions of Goku and Gohan, it's time they get down to training, since he has no intention of allowing himself or his sons to be shown up by Kakarot and his boy. This is all said in good humour, but all the same, Future Trunks eagerly agrees to test himself against his father, while Teen Trunks grins that he's going to whoop both their butts. Heading into the gravity room, the three Saiyans take fighting stances, with the younger Trunks making the first move, as he lunges his future self, wanting to get a feel for his strength. Foolishly, Future Trunks assumes that since this version of him is similar in age to when he came back to fight the androids, he will be of similar power. However, this mistake earns him a fist to the face, as President Trunks far exceeds that estimate, having fought a god and trained with an angel. A little worried, Teen Trunks asks his dad if he went overboard, but Future Trunks grins that it's fine. In fact, he's glad to see how strong the kid is, since it means he doesn't have to hold back as much. He then flares his aura and lays down a volley of punches, which force the younger Trunks onto the defensive. But before he can overwhelm his younger self, a new presence makes itself known as Raditz enters the fray. Due to having an infinite energy engine, the Elder Saiyan has no fear of Key Drain forcing him out of a transformation, but this does not mean he can exist permanently in Super Saiyan God, as the form requires a degree of focus due to Godly Key still being relatively foreign and something his upgrades were not built to handle. As a result, it takes him a moment to tap into the form, but now that his hair and eyes are crimson, he is ready to put his sons to the test. However, as he flies up to meet the boys, he is shocked to see the confusion in the Elder Trunks' face, and after they exchange a brief salvo of punches and kicks, the future well ask what form that is. Furrowing his brow, Raditz states that it's Super Saiyan God, and that he figured it was the form Trunks was referring to yesterday, since he attained it by training with a godly being just like Trunks described. Shaking his head, Trunks replies that his form is very different, though if his dad and counterpart want to see it, he'll happily give them a taste. 
At once, Future Trunks' aura flares a bright white, though beyond that there aren't many cosmetic changes, with the spikes in his hair perhaps being a little more pronounced. Compared to the marked difference Super Saiyan God makes to Raditz' appearance, it is a little underwhelming in present Trunks' eyes, though the boost in power it gives his future self is massive. Having the ability to sense God Key, Teen Trunks can tell that at this moment Future Trunks and his dad are roughly comparable in strength and with a wash of annoyance he realises that puts them both well ahead of him. Nonetheless, he is a Saiyan warrior, and so enters his highest state, Super Saiyan 2, before throwing himself at the duo with the intention to fight his hardest. Unfortunately, this fight is a rather short one, as a single gut punch from Ultimate Trunks is enough to send his young counterpart into a wall where he slumps unconscious. For a time, Future Trunks and Raditz continue their training, but when it becomes clear that present Trunks isn't just playing possum to lull his opponent into a false sense of security like his dad taught him, the elder duo call their match to a halt and go to check on the boy. As it turns out, Trunks has ten broken ribs, with the four closest to where his elder counterpart hit him being almost completely vaporised. Urgently, Raditz runs from the room, yelling that he'll go to Corrin's and get his son a senzu bean, while Future Trunks, being racked with guilt, gently lifts his younger self in his arms and carries him to the Capsule Corp infirmary. Word of Trunks' injury spreads fast throughout the compound, and so before the nurse can even put in the boy's IV drip, Bulma is at his side, furiously asking her future son if Raditz did this during their training. Sheepishly, the long-haired Trunks admits that it was his fault. He misjudged the boy's strength, and he's very sorry, a statement which causes a mix of emotions to cross Bulma's face, before she sharply tells him to learn from this mistake, her attention turning to present Trunks. Kneeling down to inspect him, she tells the boy that she's here, her voice barely above a whisper, and in spite of himself, Future Trunks can't help but smile, being so reminded of the way his own mum would look after him when he got hurt. However, this just reminds him that she's trapped alone in a timeline with Goku and Gohan Black. In an instant, bile rises in his throat, as his nostalgia is replaced by terror. A few minutes later, Raditz enters the sick room, a brown drawstring bag in his hands, and as he kneels beside his wife to gently place a bean in present Trunks' mouth, the future version reflects on how he's never seen his past father look so shaken. Even when he lay dying during the Soul Games, there was less fear in his eyes than there is now. It is only when the younger Trunks opens his eyes that his parents' expressions lose the veneer of fear, with Raditz shakily asking how his son feels. Sitting up and touching the sight of his newly healed injury, Teen Trunks replies that he feels angry since he's still too weak to stand alongside his dad and the others as a warrior. Finally feeling like he has something of value to contribute, Future Trunks steps forward, telling his teenage counterpart that he's incredibly strong, far stronger than he was at that age. In fact, he's pretty sure this Trunks could take on the androids and maybe even sell by himself. Leaping to her feet, Bulma exclaims that that's it, her shift in mood so rapid that it startles everyone. Curiously, Future Trunks asks what's it, to which his mother replies that Cell came here in a time machine, didn't he? Why not use that time machine to return to the future. Face splitting in a wide grin, Future Trunks cheers that she's brilliant. Of course, Cell's time machine would still be in this timeline, meaning he has a way to get home. The pair then hug in delight before Trunks turns to his father and past self, and with a smile for each of them, tells them to follow him. Working together, it only takes about an hour of searching for the heroes to find the time machine, and when present Trunks stumbles upon it, he flares his key to call the others over to him. Landing beside the young man, Future Trunks and Rats confirm that in spite of its coating of moss and mud, this is indeed Cell's time machine, and after Trunks reverts it to a capsule freeze of transport, the trio return to Capsule Corp. Back at the compound, Bulma sets to work ensuring that everything is still in operable condition, as well as expanding the cockpit to allow for more than one passenger, since with Raditz and both Trunks as being tall and broad men, there is no way that they can all squeeze in at once. As she works, the boys start gathering allies for the trip to the future, and knowing that each warrior they bring means extra time Bulma has to spend upgrading the time machine to fit them, they settle on a five-man band. Future Trunks, Present Trunks, Raditz, Nappa, and Gohan. Tien is also offered a spot by Raditz, but the Triclops politely declines, saying at this point the power gap between himself and the Saiyans would make his contribution negligible, though he does promise to keep watch from the lookout just in case. Nappa is also somewhat hesitant to join the team, stating that with him being at the end of his prime years, he might just slow them down, as he can already feel the effects of his age catching up with him. That's why he didn't fight in the tournament with the others. However, Gohan points out that frontline fighting isn't the only role the bald man can perform. His Yardradian abilities could still prove incredibly useful. 
helpful. This at last gets Nappa to accept, and so when the squad return to Capsule Corp, they are pleased to see that the time machine is ready. Hastily, the defenders of Earth prepare to pile in and take off to the future, but putting a hand out to stop them, Future Trunks says they shouldn't leave from here, since if he was Goku or Gohan Black, he'd have laid a trap in the future ruins of Capsule Corp, just in case he managed to find a way to return to his timeline. Shrugging, Nappa says they could go to the wasteland where they first met Trunks if the future dweller prefers. With a shake of his shaggy head, Future Trunks replies that he has a better idea, asking if Gohan could take them all to the sacred world of the Kais. Nonplussed, Gohan agrees, kai kai them all over, much to the consternation of Kibito, who says that Gohan's making a bad habit of coming and going as he pleases, reminding the young Guardian that this is a sacred space, not a clubhouse. Chuckling self-consciously, Gohan says they'll just be going, having Future Trunks pop the Time Machine's capsule and climb inside. Briefly, Kibito looks relieved, thinking Gohan's just fulfilling his request from earlier, but this is promptly replaced by shock when the others also climb into the Time Machine and begin powering it up. Waving his arms frantically, the pink kai pleads with them not to do this, since this will constitute several additional violations of cosmic law, all taking place in the sacred world of the Kais, a fact Lord Zeno will surely notice. However, with an apologetic look, Gohan says he's afraid they're going to have to bend the rules a little this time and hope for the best, as he too takes his place in the time machine. The sight of an appointed deity flagrantly defying the decree of the Omni King is too much for Kibito, and as his eyes roll back in his head, he faints, which is probably for the best, as it means he does not technically witness the crime of time travel occur. A few minutes later, the time machine exits the time stream on a very similar sacred world of the Kais, though instead of being greeted by Kibito, the heroes are met by a wrinkly old Kai with a mustache, who they all surmise is the Elder Kai. Irritably, Elder Kai demands to know what's going on here, but with a low bow, Future Trunks explains that he has gathered warriors from the past to help him take out a duo of villains plaguing the universe. In contrast to Kibito's aghast reaction, Elder Kai waves this off, just telling Trunks not to go shouting about such things, clearly not caring so long as he doesn't have to deal with the threat himself. He then begins to toddle away but is stopped by Future Trunks who says they urgently need the Kai's help. That's why they appeared here rather than on Earth. Crabbly, Elder Kai Huff's the young hybrid only ever visits when he wants something. But all the same he asks what Trunks needs, with the future warrior explaining that he wants the old Kai to perform the same ritual he did on him on his past self. This shocks everyone, with Teen Trunks asking why him when he's the weakest of the team. But with a smile, Future Trunks explains that this ritual unlocks a warrior's potential, and the boy has some incredible untapped power. He just knows it. Present Trunks remains skeptical, suggesting it might work better on someone like Gohan, but the Guardian replies that his cousin is selling himself short, a claim Future Trunks agrees with, telling his counterpart that the ritual took him from weaker than Cell to stronger than Boo. So imagine what it'll do to a younger, stronger version of him who has seemingly greater potential. It might just be the key to saving this timeline. At these words, Raditz, Nappa, and Gohan all add their support to Future Trunks' claim, expressing the faith they have in the teenage Trunks. And drawing confidence from this, the young hybrid nods, telling the Elder Kai to give him his instructions and he'll do whatever it takes to complete the ritual. This bravado is somewhat curtailed, however, when the wrinkly old deity explains that Trunks' job will be to sit still and not be a nuisance. Hardly the great act of heroism the boy expected to be required to come into his true power. And so the ritual begins, with Elder Kai frolicking and dancing around Trunks while the boy sits perfectly still on the ground. By the Elder Kai's estimates, it will take about 5 hours to complete this part of the ritual, and then another 20 or so of Trunks holding that position for his full power to be drawn out, a claim which makes the teen groan, though his elder self encourages him to look on the bright side, by this time tomorrow he'll likely be even stronger than him. While the rest of the Saiyans wait for Trunks to be done getting his potential unleashed, Gohan asks the Elder Kai where this timeline's version of him and his dad are, wanting to meet them. However, the old Kai explains that they moved on to heaven years ago, since they were only sticking around in the hope Shin would cave and give his life to revive future Gohan. But with the young whippersnapper Kai now being dead, and him as the last Kai being unable to do any such thing even if he wanted to, there was no point for them to stay, and so they left to go be with their friends and family who died in the android attack decades ago. Though disappointed, Gohan says he understands, hoping his future counterpart and father are happy wherever they are. Seeing that there's no reason to stick around then, future Trunks suggests that the rest of the team head down to Earth to confront Goku and Gohan Black. Though Nappa replies that he'll hang back since he'd like to learn more about the Kai's ritual, and this way when Teen Trunks is ready, he can use instant transmission to bring them directly to the battlefield. Raditz praises his comrade, calling this good thinking, and so it is that he, Gohan, and Future Trunks depart, while the Elder Kai, Present Trunks, and Nappa remain on the sacred world of the Kais. 
Touching down in the ruins of West City, Gohan, Raditz, and Trunks stare out at the desolated city, with the father and son duo feeling a particular pang of sorrow. For Raditz, he hadn't realized it up until this moment, but he has lived here longer than anywhere else in his life. It was a safe and stable place where he met his wife, and together they raised their son. To see it turned to ash by the cruel whims of some imposters using his family's faces fills him with rage. Meanwhile, Trunks is forced to grapple with the fact that all he worked for in restoring this place can be swept away in an instant, creating a sense of powerlessness similar to what he imagines his young counterpart felt when they clashed. Nonetheless, neither can afford to wallow, with Trunks instructing his father and cousin to go find Goku and Gohan Black, while he goes to look for his mother, promising to come join them once he's gotten her to safety. Nodding, the Saiyans split up, with Trunks heading for Bulma's place, while the uncle-nephew duo fly towards the massive source of malicious key that can only be the villains wrecking havoc on a new group of innocents. A little while later, the pair arrive in another ruined city, and to their distinct lack of surprise, Goku Black is maniacally massacring a group of fleeing humans, laughing as he does. At his side floats Gohan Black, along with a green-skinned Kai that neither Saiyan knows, and while the Kai encourages his allies' bloodlust, the imposter Gohan almost seems annoyed, testily asking why waste time on these unnecessarily frivolous kills, when they could simply raise this world now that the Saiyan and the Abomination Android are gone. Mockingly, the green-skinned Kai asks if his comrade is feeling sympathy for these sinful mortals, but with a scowl, Gohan Black replies that it's not that. He agrees that mortals need to be exterminated so they can start anew, but he doesn't see the point in torturing them before they die. Smirking, Goku Black replies that the point is they must be made to pay penance for their transgressions. Though before he can elaborate, Raditz calls out, asking what about Black? What penance should he be made to pay for all the people he and his cohort have killed? Turning as one, Goku Black, Gohan Black, and the green-skinned Kai all look up at the Saiyans, with the former leering that their timing could not be better. After all, what better proof that mortals need punishment than a pair of time-traveling Saiyans? He then looks to Gohan Black, saying that now he will get his righteous vengeance on the real Gohan just like he wanted. A claim the imposter does not refute, but before their mirror duel can begin, the real Gohan leaps into action, transforming into Super Saiyan Rage, and lunging down at Goku Black, screaming that this time he won't let him get away. Remembering the beating he received last time, Goku Black flies backwards, though this is not a retreat, rather a feint that allows Gohan Black to swoop in and attempt to behead the Guardian with a chop. Ducking low, Gohan avoids this and retaliates with a ball of key thrust into the imposter's chest that sends him crashing into a building, his torso exposed and burned. He then turns his attention to Goku Black, only to receive a knee to the mouth as his father's dark reflection leers at Gohan, his hair now blood red. Goku Black then delivers a scissor kick to the top of the young man's head, sending him careening into the pavement below, but before he can finish the job with a black Kamehameha, Reddit's holds a Saturday crush, ordering this facsimile of his brother to eat it and die. How However, Goku Black only does one of those things, as while he does allow the key orb to badly wound him so that he falls from the sky, he still manages to cling onto life. Raditz doesn't care though, readying another key blast to finish the faker and end his reign of terror, but before he can, he feels himself being pulled into a full Nelson by Gohan of all people. The second glance informs the Saiyan that this is in fact Gohan Black, though it does raise the question of how he is back in fighting shape so soon, though this is answered an instant later as the Green Kai appears beside Goku Black and lays a hand upon him. He Healing him back to full strength. Swaggering back to his feet, Goku Black maniacally thanks Rats for the free power increase, promising that he will return the favor. That is if he can survive his next attack. Gohan Black then kicks Rats down to the ground, where the Kai is waiting to plant a boot on his head, holding him in place as Goku Black charges another Black Kamehameha at point blank range. For all the courage he's gained through the love of family and friends, Raditz still has his strong self preservation instinct, and this pushes him to escape, quite literally, as he pushes off the ground and to his great shock finds that the Kai is far weaker than the others, being easily knocked away by the motion. Recognizing the importance of this revelation, Raditz yells out to Gohan, informing Forming him of the villain's weakest link, for which the young hybrid thanks his uncle as he bursts back onto the scene going straight for the Kai with the intent to kill. This charge is intercepted by his doppelganger who instead redirects them into the side of a skyscraper, attempting to stab Gohan in the heart with one of the pieces of broken window. Thinking fast, Gohan darts out an arm to shield himself, though has to bite down to keep from screaming as his left arm is impaled by the 
foot long glass shard. Coldly, Gohan Black orders the young man to stop struggling, and as his malefic aura burns with scorn, real Gohan at last knows who is wearing his face, telling him as much and urging Kibito to give up the ghost. Letting out a noise that could be anything from amusement to derision, Gohan Black calls this well deduced, confirming that he is in fact Kibito, though this just raises more questions, such as how he was able to come into possession of Gohan's body, and why he'd do such a thing. Flaring his aura to blow Gohan back, the former Kai replies that he doesn't need to explain himself to the mortal, though it is a new voice who replies, saying that perhaps not, but he does have to answer for his crimes. Heads whipping round, heroes and villains alike witness his future trunks burst onto the scene, his keyblade alive as he drives into Gohan Black's chest, screaming this is for the world he and his allies turned into a living hell. Drawing heart from this, Raditz makes a beeline for the Green Kai to prevent him from healing his comrade, yelling at his son to kill the fake Gohan while he has the chance. However, Trunks sadly never gets that opportunity, as with speed beyond sight, Goku Black joins the group in the sky, peppering Trunks with key bolts and forcing him to relinquish his hold on his sword. Gohan immediately rushes in to assist his cousin, and with Gohan Black still badly injured, this leaves the healer exposed. Seizing the opportunity, Raditz raises a shining Friday in his fist, which he brings down on the Kai's head, destroying it instantly and dealing a seemingly decisive blow to the villains. Cackling proudly, Raditz gloats the fake Saiyans made a critical error leaving the most crucial man unattended, but all mockery is promptly cut off as a pair of green hands snap the long-haired Saiyan's neck. As Raditz's body falls to the ground, the uninjured form of the Green Kai smirks down at him, chuckling the Saiyan was a fool to test God's immortality. From above, Trunks sees Red, remembering how his timeline's version of Raditz died to buy him a chance to live. He won't lose his father again. He can't. Not in the same way. Jumping right into ultimate, he grabs hold of his broken sword hilt, igniting it with jagged key as he prepares to attack the green-skinned bastard over and over again until there aren't even atoms of him to put back together. In that moment, he doesn't care about Goku and Gohan Black. They can fill him full of holes, rip him limb from limb, kill him 1,000 awful ways. It doesn't matter, so long as the Kai dies first. However, before he can enact his vengeance, a pair of arms wrap around him, Gohan's arms, and assuming it's black, Trunks rams the pommel of his sword into Gohan's nose, only for his cousin to cry out in pain. Mind still addled by rage, Trunks snarls at Gohan to let him go, but firmly and with a far more level head, Gohan tells him that with their enemy having an immortal healer who can bestow infinite Zenkai boosts on their enemy, attacking them only helps them. Instead, they should get Raditz to safety, since given a person can survive up to four minutes after having their neck broken, there's a chance he's not dead yet, and with a senzu bean they can save him. These are just the words Trunks needs to hear, and so acquiescing to Gohan's plan, he instead dives for Raditz's prone form, while the Guardian fires off a solar flare to cover their escape. A few minutes later, the two half Saiyans land in the ruins of a house, clearing away some of the rubble so Trunks can lay Raditz on the table, while Gohan fishes for the pouch of senzu beans his uncle had on him. Thankfully, there are more beans inside, and when one is placed gently into the Saiyan's mouth, his neck re-knits itself, and his eyes flutter open. Paying no heed to the fact that his neck was very recently broken, the two younger men throw their arms around Raditz, expressing their relief that he's okay. Grinning, Raditz mock scolds them for doubting him, declaring it'll take more than a green bean with a bad mohawk to take him out, before asking what happened after he went down. It is with a heavy heart that Gohan recounts their choice to retreat, but Raditz seems untroubled, calling this wise, since with the Zenkai's Kibito and his ally received, they'll be even stronger now, not to mention they were at a numbers disadvantage. Better to bide their time until Nappa and present Trunks arrive. Thankfully, Trunks knows just the place to lie low, leading his father and cousin to future Bulma's safe house, where they are happy to find her alive and well. This results in a touching moment between future Bulma and Raditz, as the future dweller greets her husband's counterpart, clearly delighted to see some version of him after over a decade without him. In turn, Raditz gives her a smile, saying that he knows if her Raditz was here, he'd want to thank her for doing such a wonderful job raising their son without him, and express his abiding love for both of them. The remainder of the evening is spent resting at Bulma's place, and for the most part it is a pleasant experience of swapping stories and comparing how different their worlds have become in the days since the Cell Gains. The only awkward moment is during the recounting of that day's battle, when Bulma asks Gohan how he knows so much about broken necks. Despite it being an innocuous question, the young guardian quickly grows flustered, awkwardly mumbling something that sounds like a teacher once told him that. 
In the morning, the heroes of the future are joined by Nappa and Teen Trunks, the latter of whom has undergone a drastic power increase, as well as a sudden sharpening of his features that gives him a mature look more akin to his future counterpart. Now with a full team assembled, the five Saiyans depart for where they sense Goku Black, Gohan Black and their mysterious Kai ally, who upon seeing him, Teen Trunks reveals is none other than Zamasu, the Kai he and Uncle Kakarot visited the other day. To their surprise, the lair of these monsters is in fact a pleasant countryside cabin with a trio of villains sit sipping tea. Nonetheless, the younger Trunks has no qualms about putting a key bolt through their roof as he orders the bad guys to come up here so he can knock them back down. Scowling, Goku Black quips that he could swear there are more vermin here than yesterday, while Zamasu nods his agreement, saying the two of them even look the same to him. Truthfully, all these mortals look alike to him, but these two especially so. Finishing his own tea, Gohan Black states that is because they are, the younger one is the Trunks from his and Goku Black's timeline, while the elder one is from here. He then meets Future Trunks' eye and in a firm voice states that he shouldn't have come back here since he offered the mortal a chance to live, which is a courtesy the time traveler did not extend to this reality's version of him. Future Trunks has no idea what the former Kai is talking about, though he isn't given much time to find out as present Trunks has grown sick of this idle chit chat and so charges forth, eager to test his new power. Powering up into Super Saiyan God, Goku Black meets the youth in midair, though to his surprise he is not able to knock this bread away as easily as he had thought. In fact, Trunks' power seems superior to the Pseudo Saiyans. With a hint of concern in his supercilious voice, Goku Black calls for Gohan Black to join him, but this idea is promptly stopped in its tracks as the real Gohan along with future Trunks appear in front of him, firing tandem blasts that send him soaring back into the nearby woods. Raditz then joins his teenage son, also in his own god form, and together they force Goku Black to retreat back towards the city, while Nappa focuses on fighting Zamasu, since even if he cannot kill him, he can stop him from assisting his allies. The hero's plan is a simple one, divide and conquer, having realized that neither Goku nor Gohan Black have bothered to learn how to fight defensively in their stolen bodies, since with Zamasu to heal them, they believe injuries are to their benefit. This is their Achilles heel, and if the Saiyans can exploit this, they should be able to take these monsters down. In the city, Raditz and Trunks continue their onslaught against Goku Black, whose considerable strength is no match for a Trunks that is full potential and a Raditz with the power of a god. Recognizing this, the imposter resorts to trickery and dirty moves, trying to use Raditz's paternal feelings against him by targeting Trunks in the hope the older San will make a mistake while trying to protect his offspring. However, there are two fatal flaws in Goku Black's plan. Firstly, as it stands, Trunks is stronger than his father, and Raditz knows this, having faith in his son to look after himself. And secondly, the faker has forgotten who he is fighting, Raditz, the master of sneaky tactics. Against such a seasoned coward, there is nothing this wannabe can pull that Raditz hasn't already seen and likely perfected, and so any advantage Goku Black may have is fleeting at best, with the father-son duo quickly regaining their upper hand and driving said hand into their enemy's face over and over again. Meanwhile, in the forest, Gohan Black is facing similar issues, except he is facing down a Super Saiyan Rage Gohan and Ultimate Future Trunks while still in his base form. As one would expect, this goes badly for the being formerly known as Kibito, with him being beaten into a bloody pulp within a matter of minutes. Slumping against a tree, Gohan Black awaits his death, and Trunks is more than happy to provide, summoning a sword of ki and laying it against his throat. Through bloodied teeth, Gohan Black asks if Trunks feels proud murdering two versions of him, but with a growl, the future dweller says he doesn't know what the former Kai is talking about. Scowling, Gohan Black tells him not to play innocent, since he knows how the half Saiyan was happy to let him and Lord Shin die so that he could kill Boo, but Trunks calls this a bold-faced lie, saying Kibito made the choice to sacrifice himself so that both him and Shin could live. They were comrades, and more than that, they were friends. The ferocity with which Trunks says this, clearly emanating grief for his fallen friend, gives Gohan Black pause, and in that moment, the Saiyans can see a war going on behind his eyes. Gohan then asks a question of his own, something about his doppelganger's story not quite sitting right with him. He said that he was from his timeline, so how does he know so much about future Kibito's death? A little of his old surety returning, Gohan Black Black answers that Zamasu witnessed it and relayed the details when he offered him a chance to join his mission. Coldly, Trunks asks if the imposter ever considered that the Green Kai might have been lying to manipulate him, but Gohan Black protests that it's easy to suggest such things without proof. Placidly, Gohan asks what proof Zamasu offered, but Black scowls that the only proof needed was to remind him of the audacity of Gohan and his father, preying on Lord Shin's good nature to try and make him surrender his life for a mortal child, and then
then having him give up his own without a moment's pause or a word of thanks. Mortals like them are a plague with no respect for the Kais. The universe will be better and safer when they are wiped out and the gods can start again with a clean slate. Anger still bubbling below the surface, Trunks hisses that he will show the former Kai about a lack of respect for the Kais, though instead of beheading him like his tone would suggest, he pulls him to his feet, thrusting him at Gohan and requesting that his cousin Kai Kai them to a certain location. Grabbing hold of Black so he doesn't run, Gohan nods and when Trunks lays a hand upon him, the trio teleport away. A moment later they appear in a wasteland where the weathered wreckage of some sort of metal hut stands as the only notable landmark. Dismissively, Gohan Black asks what the point of this is, but Trunks explains that this was Babidi's ship, and the place where he and Shin fell. He then instructs the former Kai to follow him, leading him and Gohan around the back of the ship, where the damage is far less extensive. Here Gohan Black sees what Trunks is getting at, as burned carefully into the metal are ten words. Here marks the resting place of Shin and Kibito, heroes. No one says a word for a moment, then in a firm voice, Trunks asks if Black really believes he has no respect for the Kais and would have traded their lives callously. Briefly, the pseudo-san attempts to mumble some rationalization of this proving nothing, but it is obvious his resolve is failing, and so looking into eyes that are a mirror of his own, Gohan urges Kibito to think deeply, since if he is from his timeline, he would remember the admiration he and his father have for both him and the Supreme Kai, the years of friendship. How can he ignore all that in favor of a story that now even he can see his faults. Letting out a deep sigh, Kibito admits that he can't ignore it any more than he can deny the truth. He was a fool to trust Zamasu and allow his fear and resentment to twist him into this. Slumping against his own memorial, the fallen Kai hangs his head, unable to meet either of the Saiyan's eyes as he humbly apologizes. And while Gohan goes to put a hand on his shoulder, Trunks merely scowls, asking if the Kai really thinks saying he's sorry will make up for all the people he's helped kill. Looking up with a drawn expression, Kibito says he knows it won't, and if Trunks wishes to take his life when this is over, he will not begrudge him. All he wants is to let the pair know how deeply remorseful he is for his actions, and if they would allow it, he would like to try and make up for his mistakes by helping them save this timeline like his better counterpart did. Trunks, not being big on forgiveness, is hesitant, but all the same he follows Gohan's lead as his cousin accepts the former deity's apology, telling him to start by explaining everything. Nodding stoutly, Kibito recounts how he came from the same timeline as Gohan, and that a few days after Goku's sparring match with Zamasu, while Shin and the Saiyan were still on Lord Zeno's world, his fellow apprentice Kai visited him, except now he was not an apprentice, and instead wore the green patara of the Supreme Kai. During that visit, Zamasu explained how through the use of time rings, as well as the green time rings, he had been exploring the multiverse and come to a troubling conclusion. Mortals are an existential threat to the Kais. No matter where he went, mortals and their hubris would eventually cause the destruction of the Supreme Kais and often their attendants, with his future timeline being used as an example. To his great shame, Kibito fell for it hook, line and sinker, allowing Zamasu to play on his insecurities around Goku replacing him as Lord Shin's successor, or else causing his death at the hands of Lord Zeno, as well as the resentment he had secretly harbored for Gohan for taking his life. Using this, Zamasu convinced him the only way to protect Kai Kind was the complete extinction of mortals, not just of this timeline, but every timeline, so they could start over with more pliant mortals who had never threatened them. Letting out a mirthless, shame-filled chuckle, Kibito adds that Zamasu even convinced him that as it stood, the current Supreme Kai were too soft on mortals, and only they had the clarity of vision and resolve needed to bring about salvation. Pure hubristic fantasy, but a tempting one nonetheless. And one he bought into, since it allowed him to see himself as a hero who was saving his people. However, before he could enact his role as divine savior, Kibito needed a living body, as he was dead, and so could not enter the mortal realm. Fortunately, Zamasu had an answer for that too, offering to use a set of ancient wish orbs called the Super Dragon Balls to allow the two of them to steal the bodies of Goku and Gohan, since it would only be fitting for Kibito to take back the life Gohan stole from him, while well, he would have Goku's body, as the Saiyan had said they were of equal power during their meeting. In his blinded state, Kibito accepted, and so Zamasu departed to find the balls. Not long after that, Kibito found himself in Gohan's body as promised, and to his greater surprise, Zamasu was already waiting for him in the body of Son Goku. To this day, Kibito does not know how his fellow Kai acquired a living version of the long-dead warrior's body, but at the time it was of no concern, as they still had another step to their plan, make contact with the Zamasu of this timeline. 
Future Zamasu was all too eager to join the Zero Mortals plan, and with him on side, they were able to track down this reality's Super Dragon Balls, and with it, grant Future Zamasu the immortality needed to ensure that he could heal them without fail should they come up against any resistance. From there, it was only a matter of doing the deed, and though he never enjoyed the same cruelty as the Zamasus, preferring to wipe out worlds as efficiently as possible, he did not stop his colleagues from making sport of the mortals. A mark of cowardice that will be his abiding shame until the day he dies. From above, a cackling voice tells Kibito that he won't have to wait long for that day, and as the trio of warriors look skywards, they see Zamasu and Goku Black floating above them. Though neither are injured, the battered state of their clothes tells the heroes that Raditz, Present Trunks, and Nappa gave them hell, a fact which pleases them all. In truth, the only reason Goku Black had managed to escape death was because Zamasu managed to Kai Kai to his location and heal him before teleporting them both away. They had subsequently come here to retrieve Gohan Black, but as they can see, he is gone, with Kibito having taken his place. Furiously, Kibito demands to know if anything Goku Black told him was true, to which Black replies he meant every word about the need for mortals to be exterminated and the other Kai's being too soft-hearted to do what had to be done, but beyond that, he simply said what the foolish old Kai needed to hear to make him play his part. This only angers Kibito further, with him asking why go to the effort when he already intended to have future Zamasu as his ally. What was the point of recruiting him? This question makes both Zamasu's laugh, as with a supercilious sneer, Black asks if Kibito really wants to know. Very well. He recruited Kibito because he needed a sacrifice. This answer stuns the three Saiyans, and so Black elaborates, saying there's a reason he chose to take Goku's body while giving Kibito Gohan's rather than offering it to his future self, and that's because he knew one day he might have to kill him. From studying them on Godtube, he quickly learned that a Saiyan gains power through their rage, which in mortals is a physiological response, and what enrages a mortal more than the loss of their spawn? Gritting his teeth, Trunks calls this a sick mindset, but with another chuckle, Black retorts that he certainly didn't want to kill kill Kibito, since it was much more useful to have a good little lapdog, but if he ever needed a little extra power which a Zenkai could not provide, he would have the option to sacrifice Gohan Black and allow Goku's body to go into overdrive at the sight of his dead son. With that in mind, he had no intention of killing another version of himself, not when good old honourable gullible Kibito was around to willingly give up his life for his allies as he did in this timeline. It was a foolproof plan. Snarling, Kibito roars that Black failed to take into account one thing, that as a Saiyan he too would gain power from his rage, and right now he's mad enough to rip the imposter's head off. He then launches upwards, preparing to engage in a brutal brawl with his former ally, only to be stopped as a key bolt from Black pierces his heart, dropping him to the ground. Smirking, Black replies that he actually did factor in the possibility Kibito would turn traitor, if something played on his soft heart. That's why he took point in every fight, while encouraging the other two to hang back, so he could gain the power to kill the Universe 7 Kai without issue. Nothing here has deviated from his plan, not for one second. Vainly, Kibito attempts to hurl one last curse at Black, but is silenced permanently as Zamasu lazily fires a blast, which takes him out in his weakened state. As the stolen body of Gohan lies limp and dead upon the ground, Black begins to laugh maniacally, while all around him, a sinister smoggy purple aura takes form. This is not the only change, however, as his hair begins to spike up, resembling Goku's in Super Saiyan, though this is no heroic gold, instead being a pale pink, while his eyes are likewise grey rather than cyan. The power of this new state is simply monstrous, making Super Saiyan God and Super Saiyan Rage seem insignificant by comparison. Having sensed this massive swell in energy, Nappa instant transmissions over along with present Trunks and Raditz, and so it is the five Saiyans are together as they witness the birth of Super Saiyan Rose. Cackling, Goku Black declares that this is greater even than he imagined, pure perfection, which will now be used to burn away the mortal scourge. Even if Kibito lost his faith in the end, he was still instrumental in bringing about this, and so he shall be remembered fondly in the new world he will create. However, the same cannot be said for these Saiyan malcontents, who must now be purged. Taking their fighting stances, the Saiyans ready themselves for what they now know will be the final battle between gods and mortals. Powering up into their highest states, Gohan, Raditz, Nappa and the Trunks each leap at Black and Zamasu, though one by one they are knocked back by the awesome might of Super Saiyan Rose Goku Black. Teen Trunks, as arguably the strongest of them at this moment, comes the closest, landing a hit on the Imposter Saiyan's arm before being sent flying. Next they try attacking as a team, but this just makes them a bigger target meaning Black can launch a key blast from a distance which sends them crashing into the dirt before they can even get close to him. 
It truly does seem as though this battle is a hopeless endeavour, but even still the heroes do not give up hope, readying blasts of their own now since brute force clearly cannot solve this problem. Alas, even here Goku Blackout classes them, his new Super Black Kamehameha consuming their beams and slamming into the mortals, sending them flying in different directions. With a heavy thud, Gohan lands on his side, and as he opens his eyes, he finds himself face to face with his own dead body, or rather the body of Gohan Black. Perhaps it is the sight of his own corpse. Perhaps it is the knowledge that Kibito was just on the verge of redemption. Or perhaps it is the fact that these two Zamasus so cruelly robbed a man he has long considered a friend of that chance. But for whatever reason, as Gohan rises to his feet, he feels a new depth of fury well up inside himself. From their own prone positions, the remaining Saiyans witness this change in Gohan, as the blue shell of Calm God Ki that usually makes up the center of his Super Saiyan Rage aura begins to darken, taking on the same purplish hue as Black's aura, almost like Gohan's is becoming polluted, while his hair also darkens slightly, receiving a faint pink veneer over the gold. This change comes with a sizable power increase, and as Gohan fires off his next Kamehameha, it meets Black's, creating a stalemate before they both dissipate. Realizing this might be just the boost they need, Need, the two trunks' power up once more into ultimate, and as one begin charging up double Sundays. Seeing this, Gohan does the same, and as the three half Saiyans converge upon each other, they launch a mighty combo attack. The cousin's ultimate rage sex tuple Sunday. This fearsome three-man beam greatly surpasses anything Black can hurl back at them, and with a pained roar, the pseudo Saiyan is consumed by the blast. In the aftermath, no one can feel his energy or see any remnant of his body, a fact which causes the Saiyans to rejoice, even though there is still the matter of Zamasu to attend to. Thankfully, Nappa has a solution for this, cracking his knuckles and telling his allies to bring the Kai to him. Frantically, Zamasu attempts to Kai Kai away, but Raditz is faster, appearing in front of him and delivering a chop to his trachea which shatters his neck, and paralyzes him while also granting a bit of payback for last night. As the green-skinned Kai slumps forward, Raditz and Future Trunks each take hold under an arm and begin floating over to the burly bruiser. By now Zamasu's immortality has healed his injury enough for him to vigorously resist his captors, but it is a vain effort as Nappa stretches out a hand and presses his palm to Zamasu's chest. Hysteria in his voice, Zamasu demands to know what the mortal swine's doing to him, but with a sinister smile, the bold San responds that he's seeing how literally one should take the name of Yard at secret technique forced spirit fission. For one horrible moment, understanding blossoms on Zamasu's face. Then with a terrified scream, his soul is ripped from his body, leaving it alive but lifeless, while his soul is met with an even crueler fate. As he is not dead, he will not pass on to the other world. Instead, he will be forced to spend all of eternity invisibly watching the affairs of mortals, but unable to intervene or enact his will. A perfect permanent penance. And with that resolved, the future timeline is at last able to return to peace. Future Trunks gratefully thanks his friends and family for their help, but the other four all say it was their pleasure, promising to come to his aid whenever he needs it. After a night of celebration, it comes time for the past dwellers to return to their own timeline, a somewhat sober event, as with them having to take the time machine to get home, it means they may never see Future Trunks again. Nonetheless, no one sheds a tear at this parting, with Future Trunks clasping hands with Nappa before giving hugs to his cousin and father. Finally, there is present Trunks, and despite being being the same person, neither are quite sure what to say to each other. For a moment an awkward silence hangs between them, before with a smile, Future Trunks instructs his younger self to use his new power to look after everyone for him, calling the young man Little Bro. Smile returning to his face, Teen Trunks vows that his future counterpart can count on it, with the pair fist bumping before going their separate ways. Once they're back in the present, Gohan wastes no time kai kaiing over to Beerus' planet. Though the Destroyer is none too happy to have this impudent Saiyan drop in unannounced and without a proper food offering, his temper is somewhat calmed when Gohan explains the severity of the situation. By the end of Gohan's tale, Beerus' expression has gone from angry to shocked, and though he does grumble that he ought to destroy Gohan and his Saiyan buddies for committing the crime of time travel, he at least acknowledges there are more pressing matters, ordering Whis to take them to Universe 10's Sacred World of the Kais. Travelling by light, tunnel, Gohan, Beerus and Whis arrive on the yellow skied world in a matter of minutes, and to their surprise find no one around. Heading for Goasu's mansion, the trio see that it too is seemingly deserted, though as they move further in, they are met with a disturbing sight, Zamasu gleefully pulling the green patara from the ears of Goasu's corpse. Seeing this is all the evidence they need, Whis taps his staff on the ground, creating a bubble around himself, Beerus and Gohan, allowing them to stay in place while the world suddenly starts moving 
moving in reverse. When the bubble fades, Gohan stares in awe as an alive and well Goasu stands before him. Curiously, he asks what just happened, but with an apathetic shrug, Beerus replies, Temporal redo, before snapping at Goasu to tell him where his apprentice is. From behind him, a startled sounding Zamasu says he's right here, asking why the god was looking for him. Or rather, he begins to ask, before his sentence and life are cut short by a declaration of Hakai. As Zamasu's tea tray clatters to the floor, being the only sign that he ever existed at all, Goasu blusteringly asks why Beerus just did that. Smiling good-naturedly, Whis explains that they just witnessed Zamasu assassinate him, so they were merely dispensing justice. He then bends down, plucking two biscuits from the drop tray, before bidding the universe ten kai good day, and banging his staff on the ground once more. In a flash of light, the universe seven trio are gone, returning to their own universe, specifically their universe's sacred world of the Kais. Here they are greeted by a still flustered Kibito, who meekly asks what he can do for Lord Beerus. Raising a handful of destruction energy, Beerus tells the elderly attendant to say his prayers, but with a yell, Gohan implores Beerus to stop. Looking mildly annoyed, Beerus asks why should he? But stepping between the Kai and the cat, Gohan explains that Kibito was misled by Zamasu, so with him gone there's no chance of him turning evil, and besides he turned good again at the end, so it's clear he's not a bad guy. Weighing this up, Beerus acquiesces, though Gohan suspects this is due to laziness more than compassion, as it means he won't have to go to the effort of Kaiing two people in one day. Having no further business here, Beerus tells Whis to take him home, and with a nod Whis complies, stopping only to congratulate Gohan on his recent and power increase, and promise to come visit him and the other Saiyans again soon. When they are alone, Kibito asks the young guardian what that was all about, with Gohan taking a seat on the grass and beginning to explain the story of their trip to the future. When he is done, Kibito looks just as shocked as he did during Gohan's last visit, though now there is shame in his face as well, as he mumbles that he can't believe a version of himself was ever able to be tricked by such a transparent scheme. Giving the Kai a consoling pat on the shoulder, Gohan says that it could happen to anyone, though Kibito insists he should have known better. He then looks the young man in the eye, and with genuine curiosity asks why he stood between between him and Lord Beerus after all the horrible things he just witnessed him do. Smiling, Gohan says it was the right thing to do. After all, Kibito gave him a second chance at life when he was a kid, so he was just glad to be able to return the favor, since he never properly thanked him for that sacrifice. Smiling as well, Kibito thanks Gohan for the acknowledgement, and for the first time in their nearly 20 year relationship, calls him friend. Meanwhile, back at Capsule Corp, the rest of the Z Fighters have thrown a massive barbecue to celebrate their victory and safe return. Reddits and Nappa pile their plates high with the biggest steaks they can get their hands on, while Bulma examines Trunks' new mature appearance, praising that he looks very handsome, which just goes to show that even though he's got his dad's hair, her jeans went out in the looks department. As for the humans, Tien, Chiaotzu, and Krillin are enjoying a couple of drinks, reminiscing about the old days, and joking that they'd give anything for a King Piccolo level threat again, since it'd be fun to get back into the action. The only the only one who is absent is Gohan, though this is hardly unexpected as he is Earth's guardian which is a full time job and then some. However to everyone's surprise, they soon feel Gohan's energy approaching and when they look to the sky, they witness the guardian's descent, though he is not alone as a young woman clings to his side. Beaming broadly, Gohan greets his friends and family while introducing them all to the young woman who they learn is named Janet. Adopting a sly grin, Bulma asks her nephew how exactly he knows Janet and with a slightly awkward blush, he he admits that she's his girlfriend, a claim which makes half the group face fall, while Trunks alone laughs out loud, understanding his cousin's sketchy behaviour at last. All the same, Janet is welcomed warmly into the fold, and as the day turns into night, the party rages on, with everyone delighted that at least for now, the world is at peace, and they can share happy days such as this. It has been almost a year since the menace of Zamasu and the corrupted Kibito challenged our heroes. And in this time, everyone's appreciation for what they once falsely thought of as boring peacetime has grown exponentially. Gohan, as the guardian of Earth, sets the tone for his friends, as he not only continues his training and pursues answers around his new evolution of Super Saiyan Rage, but he also finally finds the equilibrium his parents always hoped he would, as he perfectly balances his duties as a god with time spent with his girlfriend Janet down on the surface, able at last to look at the world from the perspective of humanity, rather than distantly from the top down. Following his lead, the veteran Z Fighters too have found a balance between steadily honing themselves for the next unknown threat while also keeping what drives them to do so in perspective. This period of peace sees Bulma Trunks and Raditz taking a few vacations and family days, with a new member soon joining their family in the form of a baby girl named Bra. This combined with the decision to end Trunks' tutelage under an in-home tutor and enroll a hybrid into the local high school sees the newly appointed Big Brother 
brother remain true to his future counterpart's example, working hard to be there for those who need him in whatever form that may take. Meanwhile, Nappa having truly reached the end of his prime years has slowed down in his search for Vegeta, accepting that perhaps the prince's final fate is not one he will ever know. Nowadays he mostly finds himself hanging out at Kame House with Master Roshi, watching the tides roll in, and missing the company of trusted comrades like Raditz, Tien, or Krillin. For the latter pair, Tien has settled comfortably into his life at Capsule Corp, knowing that soon he will be called upon to serve as martial arts instructor to another of Raditz's kids, while Chatsu spends much of his time as Bra's informal nanny, wowing her with acts of telekinesis thanks to his psychic powers. Krillin's life is certainly the most high profile of the group, with him living the life of a celebrity thanks to his status as world martial arts champ. When the tournament had come round again, Raditz and Nap had threatened to enter and take his title, but this had all been in jest, allowing Krillin to once more prove himself the world's strongest human and a hero the people of Earth can admire. Life is good, and only made better when one evening Gohan reaches out to his friends and family through his godly telepathy and instructs them to join him on the lookout. At first the defenders of Earth worry the young guardian has detected some threat that requires all their attention, but when they arrive on the lookout, it is to a jubilant Gohan and Janet, with the latter revealing that Gohan has proposed. An outpouring of joy then erupts around the happy couple, with the heroes excitedly congratulating them and expressing their desire to help out however they can. This includes Bulma offering to host at Capsule Corp, Krillin offering to use his media connections to have the event televised, and Nap offering to go fetch them a super sweet Shigarian fruit to garnish the wedding cake. Modestly, Gohan thanks them all for their support, though admits that they have decided on a small ceremony up here on the lookout, just like when Goku and Chi Chi got married. And so it is that roughly a week later, Gohan and Janet's friends and family gather on the lookout to bear witness as the pair become husband and wife. Even Beerus and Whis are in attendance, with the Destroyer God looking remarkably out of place in his usual attire with the sole addition of a moth-eaten old tie that Whis seems to have forced him to wear. Chi-Chi is also present, having cashed in her one day pass to be with her son on a special day, and there are many happy tears upon their reunion, as well as when he introduces her at last to Janet. The ceremony is a short and simple one, with the Grand Supreme Kai acting as efficient, and when it ends, a party begins the like of which the lookout has not seen since the defeat of Super Boo, or perhaps the day Gohan was returned to life. Everyone manages to have a good time, be they human, alien, or deity, and between the food and dancing it is hard not to. Even the speeches are perfect, with Raditz's best man speech bringing a few of the guests to tears, as he gives a touching tribute to the pride he has in his nephew, and the joy he feels in knowing he found love. However, as is always the way, nothing can stay perfect forever. And so after one too many glasses of alcoholic punch, Beerus drunkenly challenges Gohan to battle, declaring that if the Guardian doesn't comply, he will destroy this world. In a level tone, Gohan suggests that he would be happy to fight the Destroyer tomorrow, but with an edge of petulance, Beerus snaps that he's sick and tired of waiting for his supposed arch-rival to give him the rematch he's owed, destruction energy forming in his palm, as if to say that he is deadly serious about the consequences of refusing him. Sighing that he guesses he has no choice, Gohan steps forward to do battle with the cat, but before he can get very far, Trunks steps in front of his cousin, telling him not to ruin his nice clothes and that he'll fight Beerus in his stead. Cocking a bold brow, Beerus groans that he's pretty sure Trunks is the mouthy brat he already slapped around the planet, so why would he waste time fighting him again? However, with a cocky grin reminiscent of his father's younger days, Trunks replies that a lot has changed since then, flaring his aura and entering his ultimate form. This at last gets the God of Destruction's attention, as he recognizes the form as one created by that old Kai from eons ago. And so settling into his fighting stance, he tells the boy to come at him with everything he's got. Casting off his jacket and tie, Trunks lunges forward, hurling a punch at Beerus' jaw, but the god is faster, lashing out with his tail and wrapping it around Trunks' wrist. He then pulls the bound arm into the air, holding Trunks at an awkward angle that leaves his face exposed for a slap, with Beerus intending to remind this uppity child of the lesson he ought to have learned about minding his manners. However, Trunks has come a long way since that day, and so raises his free arm to block the blow. Then, ignoring the pain jolting through his arm, he brings it back down in a chop to Beerus' emaciated ribs. Howling at this unexpected hit, Beerus slackens his grip on Trunks' wrist ever so slightly, but this is enough for the hybrid Saiyan, who wriggles free of the hold and strikes his foe with a shining Friday to the head. The force of this hit sends Beerus crashing into the lookout's thick paving stones, and as he lies there, those who know the cat wonder if he's been vanquished. However, when he sits back up with clearer eyes, they realize that all Trunks managed to do with that hit was sober the Destroyer up. 
or rather, that is the main achievement. With the other being that Trunks' Shining Friday also managed to disintegrate the bottom half of Beerus's tie, a fact the deity is none too happy about, as he snarls that this was his only tie, so now Whis is going to subject him to an arduous shopping trip to find another. For that alone, he should destroy the boy. Gulping, Trunks begins to stammer that he's really sorry, and that he has a bunch of ties at home that Beerus can choose from. But the damage is already done, as an instant later, the destroyer god appears in front of Trunks and drives a knee into his gut that sends him flying to the stratosphere with a sonic boom. Vanishing again, Beerus appears above Trunks, ready to slam him back down to Earth. But thankfully, Trunks' quick mind inherited from his mother allows him to formulate a counter on the fly, and so as Beerus' tail swings down, Trunks launches a kick up to counter it. He then rights himself in midair and throws himself at the god once more, this time being able to close the distance and begin trading blows with Beerus. It is a surprisingly close match, with each giving roughly as good as they get, though Beerus does have one advantage Trunks does not, that being his ability to breathe in space. With the air being being so thin this high up, it is only a matter of time before this begins to weigh on Trunks, and as he begins to flag, Beerus seizes more and more opportunities to exploit his failing body. One such maneuver even sees him grab the boy in a full Nelson, then drop down to the lookout at high speeds, pile driving Trunks into the pavers with a nasty crack. However, even this is not enough to keep the spunky half Saiyan down, as with a cry he lurches back up, slamming his fist into Beerus's jaw. While employing his godly reflexes, Beerus does the same to Trunks. For a moment, both combatants stand with their fists buried in the other's cheek, neither seemingly able to break the deadlock. Then from behind them, a voice declares this has gone far enough. Turning to see the speaker, Trunks and Beerus see not Gohan or even Bulma, but instead Janet, as she scolds them that they should stop this silly fighting and use their words. Turning first to Beerus, she reminds him that Trunks tried to apologize for damaging his tie, while to Trunks she asks if he can understand why what he did hurt Beerus' feelings. Looking more than a little stunned at the way she is speaking to them, both Trunks and Beerus mumble their acknowledgement of what she's saying. Then Beerus gruffly tells the boy to show him those spare ties, admitting that for what it's worth, he might make a decent rival if Gohan doesn't live up to the role. Though Trunks says nothing to this, those who know him best immediately notice the change in his eyes, as if suddenly a terrible weight has been lifted from his shoulders, even though he did not beat Beerus or even come close to it. The fact that he can stand up to the Destroyer now is enough to allow him to finally put his fear of Beerus behind him, and as he passes his parents and Gohan, they each give him a smile, happy to see that he has found some peace. Meanwhile, the rest of the guests have all gathered around Janet, gushing at how she so effectively broke up that fight. Modestly, Janet admits that as a preschool teacher, she's had plenty of practice, causing Nappa to quip that maybe next time they come up against a world ending threat, they should bring Janet along and see if she can talk them out of causing havoc. With an amused smile, Janet looks to her new husband, asking what he thinks of her joining him in the world saving business. With a broad genuine smile of his own, Gohan replies that he would be happy to have her, though first if she'd be up for it, he'd like to have one more dance. From here on out, everything about the wedding is perfect. Well, almost everything. The absence of Goku weighs heavily on Gohan, though he hardly blames his father, as he knows that he and Shin have still not returned from the Omni King's palace. Instead, he worries for his father's safety, and more than anything, he wishes he could have been here today. Finally, it comes time for the reception to end, and with broad smiles, Gohan and Janet thank everyone for coming and bid them farewell. The hardest goodbye is understandably Chi Chi's, though echoing Raditz, she expresses both pride and joy for her son, giving him a hug, then urging Janet to look after him. Smiling at her mother-in-law, Janet solemnly vows to do just that, earning her a smile as Chi Chi praises her son for picking such a kind and scholarly bride, then returns at last to Otherworld, leaving the newlywed couple alone. Following this, life returns to normal, though it comes as little surprise to anyone when shortly after the wedding, Gohan and Janet announce they are expecting. In what seems like no time at all, the Z-Warriors find themselves back on the lookout, this time to welcome Gohan and Janet's new baby into the world. Thanks to some assistance from Whis, the delivery is instantaneous and pain-free, and as the angel hands the couple their child, they are delighted to finally be able to meet their son. Thanks to Janet's methodical nature, they already have a name planned out, and so it is that when they present the baby to their family and friends, it is as Son Gohei, written with the kanji for enlightenment and warrior, in the hopes that he will find balance between mind and muscle. As the first ever quarter Saiyan born, Raditz and Nappa are fascinated by him, wondering if this genetic mixing with Gohan's potent potential will make him an even more formidable warrior than his father, while Trunks with his toddler sister in his arms is amazed at the thought of being an uncle. As for the humans, 
they are simply happy for Gohan and Janet, giving their congratulations. Though Bulma is curious why Whis did not offer her the same assistance when she gave birth to Bra. Despite the many challenges Gohan has experienced during his turbulent life, and even brief afterlife, nothing comes close to the early days of parenthood. He and Janet are on constant alert to make sure Gohei is safe and comfortable, worrying late into the night about troubles that may not even afflict him for years, if ever. However, all their fears and labors are well worth it, as when their son is at peace and the three of them are together, there is no greater joy in all the world, and Gohan at last truly knows what he has been fighting for for all these years. Though it seems the Guardian's fighting days may not be over yet, as a few months later, the lookout receives an unexpected guest, that being Goku. Gohan is of course delighted to see his father, welcoming him home and introducing him to Janet and Gohei, but he can't help but express his surprise at his arrival, considering it's been two years since he and the Supreme Kai were summoned to Lord Zeno's palace, and no one's heard a word from them since. Giggling absentmindedly and rubbing the back of his head, Goku asks if it's really been that long, saying it's really easy to lose track of time when you're dead. Solemnly, Gohan confirms that it has been, before asking the more pressing questions. What happened during his audience with the Omni King, and why is Goku here now? Growing serious, Goku explains that he and Shin were called to Zeno's palace to discuss his spa with Zamasu from Universe 10. Figuring it had been something like this, Gohan asks if the Omni King was angry about that, but here Goku shakes his head, saying actually he was thrilled and wanted his and Shin's help planning a multiversal tournament, kind of like the one they had on the Sacred World of the Kais, so he could see more awesome fights. This is the last thing Gohan had been expecting, and so he goggles as Goku continues, explaining for the last two years, the three of them along with Zeno's attendant the Grand Priest had been hammering out the details. In the end, they had decided on a style similar to the World Martial Arts Tournament, where it would be single fights, though with teams like their Sacred World Tournament, to make sure that every universe is a fighting chance. Team size is determined by something called model level, which basically means the overall quality of the models of that universe. As one of the weak universes, they are being permitted to have a team of four fighters, though the Omni King did want him to mention that he wants three of those slots to be filled by Gohan, Trunks, and Raditz, as he enjoyed their fights on the Sacred World. Though Gohan is slightly perturbed at the notion that their universe is considered one of the weaker ones, he isn't overly concerned, telling his dad in that case he can be their fourth member, and there'll be nothing to worry about. Giggling again, Goku replies that while he'd love to compete, he's been forbidden from entering, since as the one who helped create all the rules, he'd have an unfair advantage. Instead, he's been given a different role, though he'll be present to cheer Gohan on. Sighing, Gohan says he guesses he understands, suggesting he might ask someone like Nappa or Tien to be their fourth fighter, since it's okay if one of their fighters isn't quite as strong as the others. However, here Goku stops his son, remembering the most important role that he'd meant to tell him, that if all the fighters on any given team are eliminated, then their universe will be erased. Despite his joy at being reunited with his dad, Gohan can't help but scold him here, telling Goku that he should have mentioned that first, since it changes everything. How are they supposed to protect the universe from erasure with just four people? Adopting a look of calm confidence, Goku lays a hand on his son's shoulder, saying that he knows he'll find a way. Though, he better choose a fourth fighter soon, since the tournament's in three days. This at last is too much for Gohan, who falls backwards, having seemingly fainted from this shock on top of all the others. As baby Gohei giggles at his daddy's silly antics in her arm, Janet sighs that she guesses it's up to her, telling Goku it was lovely to meet him, before going to find Mr. Popo, to ask him to summon the Z Fighters at once. A few minutes later, the heroes of Earth are all standing in the lookout's courtyard, and while at first they assume they are being called to celebrate the return of Goku, like with the last two happy summons, their delight quickly cools into fear as a recovered Gohan fills them in on the situation. Understanding the severity of their predicament, Nappa, Tien, and Krillin are all hesitant to take part in the tournament, for fear of dragging their universe down. However, if there truly is no other choice, all three of them willing to step up and do their duty. Smiling gratefully, Gohan thanks them, though from the side, Goku grins mischievously, saying that while he's not allowed to fight in the tournament, that doesn't mean he can't recommend a fighter. Looking at him with curiosity, the heroes ask if Goku has someone in mind, to which the former Guardian replies that he knows just the guy, though he's not sure how much his friends will like it, since he's a denizen of hell. Worriedly, Krillin asks if Goku's sure it's a good idea to entrust the fate of their universe to a villain, but Tien replies that it wouldn't be the first time, pointing out that aside from Gohan and Trunks, each of the Z-Warriors was Goku's enemy at one point. Noting at the logic of this, Gohan declares that he'll go with his dad to scout this mystery fighter out, while Nappa, hoping to at last get a chance to check if Vegeta's there, says he'll tag along as well. And so it is that the three Saiyans depart for hell, leaving behind their friends, with instructions to prepare, since if Goku's pick turns out to be a bust, one of them may be needed to be their fourth man. It is only when Gohan and Uncle Kakar 
Rod had gone, the Trunks notices something odd. That during that entire meeting, his dad didn't say a word. Turning to look at him, the young son of Reddits and Bulma is surprised to see a deeply troubled expression on his father's face. Though when Reddits spots Trunks looking, he hastily tries to mask it, asking if the boy is ready to go home in a forced, calm tone. The return flight to Capsule Corp passes just as silently, with Reddits making no comment at all about the shocking news they received, while the burden that now falls upon them as half of their universe's team. When they arrive back home, Trunks finally takes the initiative, asking his dad if he'd like to train with him, but with a soft shake of his head, Reddit says that maybe he'll be up for it later, though now he needs a word with Bulma. Shrugging that he guesses he'll see him later, Trunks then heads off for the gravity room, wanting to make sure he's in top shape for this tournament. While still in his mute stupor, Reddit makes for Bulma's lab. As soon as she sees him, Bulma immediately knows that something is wrong and so putting down her tools, approaches her husband to ask what's the matter. Grimly, Reddits explains the news he has received about the Omni King's tournament and the fact that he has been selected to take part in it. However, this is not all, as he also confides in Bormir's fears that he is not up to the task, since during the battle with Goku and Gohan Black, he was more of a liability than an asset, having to be protected by Gohan and the two Trunkses. He doesn't want to be the one responsible for their universe being erased, but he's afraid that with the limited time they have left, he can't catch up. Pressing her head to his chest, Bulma reassures her partner that things will be alright, though if he's concerned about not being strong enough, she may have a way to help him. However, she doubts he will like her method, since it will fly in the face of his Saiyan pride. Surprisingly, Raditz doesn't hesitate, looking down at his wife and in a solemn voice saying that he doesn't care. If her idea will allow him to protect their home, protect her and their children, then he will sacrifice anything in pursuit of that goal, even his pride. It only takes an instant for Goku, Gohan and Nappa to reach hell by Kai Kai, though for Nappa it feels much longer as a knot forms in his stomach. Any minute now, he is going to get the answer he has been seeking for many years, an answer he had thought was forever out of his grasp, and now that he is so close, he isn't sure what to hope for. All the same, when the surroundings of hell solidify around him, he sets off in search of one of the Oni Overseers to see if they can enlighten him on the fate of Vegeta. This leaves Goku and Gohan alone, with the latter commenting that he can't believe his dad was trapped here all by himself for seven years. But with a smile, Goku replies that it wasn't all bad, and he certainly wasn't alone. In fact, he can already sense his comrades coming to greet him. Good to his word, two figures soon appear on the horizon before coming in to land in front of Goku and Gohan. The first of them is a scarred man in Saiyan armor who Gohan doesn't know, but who bears an uncanny resemblance to his dad, while the other is Cell, who grins cockily when he sees who Goku has brought with him. As soon as he lays eyes on him, Gohan glares hatefully at Cell, but before he can say anything, the unnamed Saiyan pipes up barking at Goku that he better not have gotten himself banished here again for something stupid. Laughing awkwardly, Goku admits that he's just visiting this time, though he's brought Gohan with him. This catches the man's attention, with him fixing Gohan with an appraising gaze before introducing himself as Bardock, his grandfather. Humbly, Gohan bows, saying it is an honor to meet him and that his uncle Reddits always speaks highly of his father, calling him the epitome of Saiyan kind. This pleases Bardock, who gives a gruff grin, replying that he's glad to hear Reddits manage to make something of himself, before asking what the purpose of their visit is in a no-nonsense manner. Smiling, Goku answers that they're here to recruit Cell for an upcoming tournament which will decide the fate of the universe, but here Gohan flatly refuses, saying he will not fight side by side with that piece of filth. Smirk widening, Cell asks why not, reminding the young guardian of how well they once got along, before telling him that if he's afraid he'll go on a rampage, he can assure him that he's a bona fide good guy these days. Coldly, Gohan points out that this was the lie Cell spun to win their trust the first time. But truthfully, he doesn't care about Cell's betrayal. Just like he doesn't care whatever heroic deeds he might have done down here in hell. Because when he looks at him, he will always see the same thing. The monster who took his mother from him. At once, the memories of that day overwhelm Gohan, and unable to help himself, he powers up into his rose-tinted rage form, causing Cell to raise an insectoid brow as he laughs that now he has to take part in the tournament, since how could he pass up a chance to fight that? Growling, Gohan retorts that Cell won't have to wait for the tournament for that, lunging at the bio-android and swinging a kick meant to decapitate him. Arms crossed, Cell leaps back, avoiding the kick, though this does not stop Gohan who is on a rampage as he barrels forward, trying to strike his foe with everything he has. In contrast to Gohan, Cell remains perfectly calm, continuing to simply dodge attacks without any sign of going on the offense. This only further infuriates Gohan, with the young man getting progressively more and more worked up, much to Cell's amusement as he taunts that Gohan's getting slow 
sloppy, and he should remember from the Cell games what he does to sloppy fighters. This slide is seemingly one too many, as at last Gohan closes in on the Biobug, swinging a haymaker that drops Cell to the ground. Then before the android can rise to his feet, Gohan pounces on his prone form, pinning him down and laying into him with a series of punches to the face. Were he not dead, any one of these blows could have been a fatal strike, and with concern in his voice, Goku orders his son to stand down, since if he injures Cell too badly, his soul will cease to exist and he won't be able to help fight in the tournament. Gohan's only response is a hiss that he doesn't care, the venom in his voice clearly indicating that he is not in his right mind, and for a moment, Goku wonders if he should intervene and force Gohan off Cell. However, before the ex-Guardian can make a move, Cell grins that it's kind of Goku to be concerned for him, but it's not like he's in any real danger. He then flares his key, and at once the yellow crackling aura becomes flame-like as his crown and several pieces of his bio-armor are dyed a deep crimson. This development stuns Gohan, and never want to pass up an opportunity, Cell drives a backhand into Gohan's cheek, which sends the young man tumbling backwards. Rising back to his feet, Cell then declares that the Sacred World Tournament was even broadcast down here in Hell, and since then he has been working to attain a new form of his own. Eventually he was able to acquire this, which he dubbed Cell God, though this will be his first real chance to test it against a worthy opponent. By now Gohan is also back on his feet, and so runs at Cell, but still being in his sloppy berserk state, it takes very little for the bio-android to drive a lazy punch into his gut. Gasping for air, Gohan begins to fall to his knees, but even in this Cell will not allow him to have his way, grabbing the young guardian by the hair and holding him up so they can be face to face. In a tone of smug superiority, he informs Gohan that up until now he'd just been letting him vent his frustrations so they could work together more effectively as a team, but if the brat wants to play around with lethal force, then he'll have to face the consequences. A ball of key then forms in Cell's free hand, and as he lets go of Gohan's hair, the young man can't help but fall face first into it, being blasted into the air and coming down with a splash in the bloody pond. Striding over to join his opponent, Cell is surprised to see that Gohan has reverted back to his base form, suggesting that he's run out of energy, and so with a treacherous grin, asks if Gohan sees now why Team Universe 7 needs his help. Gritting his teeth, Gohan nods, and this makes Cell cackle, as he states that he's glad to hear it, promising that they will have a lot of fun together in this tournament. Rising from the pool of blood, Gohan gives his nemesis a stern look, and despite the evident gap in power between them, he warns that if he has any reason to believe Cell is going to betray or do harm to their universe, he will end him, even if it costs him his life. Laughing harder, Cell sneers that considering what happened to his parents at the Cell game, it's honestly something of a family tradition at this point. Though Gohan shouldn't worry, since as long as the other universe's fighters give him entertaining matches, he'll be more than happy to uphold his end of the bargain. Here Goku steps in, saying that he's known Cell long enough to know he's speaking the truth, but this does little to assuage Gohan's suspicion as he stalks away from Dr. Jiro's ultimate creation, a hateful glare still on his face. Sighing deeply, Goku apologizes to Cell for Gohan's actions, but with a shake of his head, the big bug tells his former comrade not to worry about it. If anything, this animosity adds a level of interest to the proceedings. Shaking his own head that Cell sure is a weird guy, Goku trots off after Gohan, promising to come get Cell when it's time for the tournament to begin. Reuniting with his son and Nappa a little ways away, Goku tells them they can go home now if they wish, but to his surprise, Nappa stops him, asking for a favor. According to the ogres, Vegeta has never passed through here, but they suggested he talk to King Yama and maybe King Kai, since if Vegeta truly is alive out there, they would be the ones best suited to help him find him. Smiling, Goku promises to take him and do the introductions, before turning to Gohan and saying that once he's done this, he'll have to return to Zeno's palace, which means they won't meet again until the tournament begins. Nodding his understanding, Gohan embraces his father, promising to train hard between now and then. The ex-guardian and Nappa then Kai Kai away, while Gohan prepares to do the same, though just as he is about to vanish into the ether, he turns back one last time, locking eyes with Cell. Hellfire bathes the lookout, its light turning the ground and building a sickly orange. In the midst of this, Gohan searches for his family, crying out for Janet and Gohei. A moment later he spots them, right in the heart of the inferno, and so takes off towards them at top speed, ignoring the flames they lick at his clothes and bite his flesh. Seeing her husband, Janet extends her one free hand towards him, with him doing likewise, though a second before their fingers can touch, a wall of flame rises between them, consuming Janet and Gohei and leaving nothing behind. 
Letting out a cry of anguish, Gohan falls to his knees, though he is not free to mourn for long, as new voices quickly call out for him. Trunks, Raditz, Bulma, his parents, Nappa, Tien, Chiaotzu, Krill, and Future Trunks, Shin, Kabito, each plead for his help, but as he moves towards them, they are all swallowed by the flames. Soon Gohan finds himself all alone, surrounded on all sides by demonic fire, which begins to laugh with cruel delight as it takes on a humanoid shape. Or rather, an insectoid shape. As when the flames have converged, they become Cell, a smug smirk plastered on his monstrous face. Furiously, Gohan demands to know why Cell killed everyone. But with a cackle, Cell retorts that he didn't kill those people. Gohan did by failing to protect them. Isn't he supposed to be their guardian after all? Gohan is left speechless by this claim, simply backing away, but so will not allow his prey to escape, advancing on Gohan until the young man is forced to stop, his ankles brushing against the edge of the lookout's courtyard. Seeing this, Cell lunges in, hurling one last accusation of failure at the Guardian before driving a perfect fist into his stomach. Gohan awakens with a start, powering up into his rose-tinted rage form before he is even fully conscious. This in turn wakes the person he is sharing the room with. Not Janet, but Trunks. Looking to his cousin with worry, Trunks asks if Gohan had Nightmare again. In returning to his base form, Gohan simply nods, refusing to burden Trunks or anyone else with what's on his mind. He then stares intently at the burn scars that line his arms, gifts of his first death match with Cell all those years ago, before rising to his feet and telling his young companion if they're both awake, then they they might as well train, since it is their last day here. Heading out into the endless void of the hyperbolic time chamber, Gohan and Trunks both assume their highest forms and begin to spar. In a place such as this, they are able to go all out, which is a blessing, as each time Gohan has a nightmare like the one he just had, he finds himself with a sudden influx of nervous energy that he needs to burn off. Trunks is more than capable of taking this, as well as dishing out a good amount of power thanks to his potential unleashed state, allowing the two young men to receive excellent gains, even if they are sore and exhausted at the end of the day. Looking at the great clock over the entranceway, Way, the pair of half Saiyans see that their time is up, and so with arms around each other's shoulders, they head back into the real world. Janet and Gohei are there to meet them, with Janet playfully complimenting Trunks on the wispy little beard he managed to grow during his year in the chamber, before hugging Gohan tight. Returning the gesture, Gohan breathes that she cannot imagine how much he has missed her and Gohei, as he takes the baby from his wife's arms and holds him close to his chest. Taking this as cue to go, Trunks bids his cousin and his family goodbye, promising to rest up like they'd planned for the final day, then meet up here when it's time for the tournament. For his day of rest, Gohan spends it with his wife and son, heading down to the surface for some family fun. It is a beautiful day, perfect for getting ice cream and taking Gohei to the park to feed the ducks. Though their activities are mundane, Gohan cherishes this time, all the while strengthening his conviction to win the tournament and protect them from all who seek to do them harm. Finally, the time comes for Team Universe 7 to assemble on the lookout, with Trunks and Reddits arriving first, along with all the Z Fighters who will not be participating. Though Gohan notices something odd about his uncle. His eyes. Their usual Saiyan black colour has been replaced by a set of ice blue irises that Gohan recognises, though he can't put his finger on. Not only that, but his key signature is entirely absent, and when asked about these changes, Reddit smiles that Bulma helped him catch up to the boys by upgrading him into a fully functional android. Now he won't be the one holding their team back. A little while after this, Shin Kabido, the Grand Supreme Kai, Beerus and Whis arrive, with Whis being excited for this peculiar tournament, while the others are more subdued. Beerus is by far in the poorest spirits, growling that if any of the Saiyans let the team down, he will personally destroy them, and it will be far more painful than anything the Omni King might do to them. Tittering, Whis tells the trio to ignore Lord Beerus, saying that he's just grumpy because unlike angels, if a team loses, their god of destruction will be erased as well. Looking to Shin, Gohan asks if this means he will also be erased if they lose. But putting on a brave face, Supreme Kai tells his young friend not to worry about him, since what is one life when compared to the whole universe? Following this, the final member of Team Universe 7 appears. That being Cell, a cocky smirk like the one from Gohan's nightmares on his face as he's escorted over by Goku. At once Gohan's hackles raise, with him positioning himself between Cell and his family. This is not lost on the Biobug, who comments that it seems the brat has something to protect. Good since it'll make him fight harder in the tournament. 
Gohan, for his part, says nothing, merely glowering at his nemesis, while Goku steps between them, reminding the pair that they are teammates, and unless they work together, the seventh is doomed. Coily, Cell replies the only one not being a team player is Gohan, as he, Cell, has no problem working with the others, and it seems that the feeling is mutual, as Raditz has gone so far as to copy him, a fact which really touches his heart. While even Tien is here, no doubt willing to lend a hand if called upon. Each of these taunts makes Gohan's blood boil, but in a reassuring tone, Janet tells her husband that it's alright, lacing her fingers through his, a simple gesture which goes a long way to calm his rage. Now with the clear ahead, Gohan tells Cell to cut the mockery, since they need to get going, and hearing the tone of leadership in his voice, the rest of Team Universe 7, along with their deities and Goku, form up on the Guardian. Smiling and waving, the remaining heroes wish their friends and family luck. Then with a faint zipping sound, they kai kai away. The Omni King's palace is not at all what Gohan, Trunks, or Raditz had expected, vaguely resembling the lookout, with a large circular courtyard and a single temple-like building. Also like the lookout, it appears to be floating above a set of clouds, though the biggest difference is that Lord Zeno's palace seems to be built atop a giant blue jellyfish, with this being where our heroes find themselves. Looking around, they spot seven other groups, each of varying sizes made up of mortals, kais, angels, and destroyer gods, while at the center of the courtyard stands a small being with an ovular head, presided over by someone who Gohan assumes must be the Grand Priest. Jolting upright, Goku yelps that he's meant to be over there too, before hightailing it to stand beside the priest, as the small creature introduces itself as Zeno, welcoming them all to his world. At once the deities all bow, and following their lead the mortals do likewise, as Zeno continues that he has summoned them all here to partake in what he has dubbed the Tournament of Power. The rules of the tournament are simple, each fight will be a one-on-one, -on -one, and will continue until one of the fighters is either knocked out, goes out of bounds, or surrenders. Also, killing is forbidden, as is key-based flight, since that would make things too easy. And of course, if a universe loses all their fighters, that universe will be erased. The way the Omni King says this in such a conversational manner sends a shiver down Gohan's spine, to the point where he almost misses what Zeno says next, though thankfully, his keen focus allows him to get the gist. It is an explanation of the team sizes. As Goku had said, the team numbers are determined by a universe's mortal level, with Universe 11 as the strongest universe having two members. Universe 2 as the next strongest has three fighters, while Universes 3, 10, 4, and 7 get four due to being roughly comparable. Being slightly weaker than average, Universe 6 has been bolstered by being allowed a fifth fighter, while Universe 9 is the clearly weakest, we fighting with a full team of six. Following this explanation, a giant bracket with everyone's names on it appears above them all, and scanning the list, Gohan finds himself in the final fight of round one. As a result, he follows the rest of his team as they are led onto floating platforms to watch as the first fight begins. Hit of Universe 6 versus Basil of Universe 9. To call this a fight would be to oversell it, as before Gohan can even take a seat, the match is over, with Hit having vanished for a fraction of a second before reappearing directly in front of Basil, his fist buried in the dog man's stomach. The force of this blow is so intense that Basil is sent flying off the edge of the jellyfish, and when he materializes back on the Universe 9 platform, Goku, who is apparently the referee, declares the match for hit. The fights that follow are similarly brief, with most of the fighters being unimpressive to the heroes of Universe 7, who have tangled with the likes of fallen Kais and Gods of Destruction. The only other contestant in the first half who catches their eye is Jiren of Universe 11, whose victory is almost as instantaneous as hits, with him simply waving a hand dismissively at his opponent, and the air current the motion creates being enough to launch the opposing fighter, another dogman from Universe 9, off the edge of the ring. With this loss, all six members of Team Universe 9 have been defeated, and as the Grand Priest announces this fact, Zeno bids them bye-bye, then with a wave of his hand, erases them. In an instant they are gone, with all that remains being their angel, and the echoes of their vain cries for mercy. How callous. How unnecessary. Following this, the Omni King excitedly declares that he's been looking forward to this next fight, as Team Universe 7 finally gets their first match, with Cell being paired against a Universe 2 fighter called Ribrienne. No one wishes the bio-android luck, as the Team Universe 7 platform is lowered back onto the ring, so Cell can disembark. And as he steps onto the field, he admits that he had hoped for someone a bit more impressive. Testily, Ribrian declares that nothing is more impressive than the power of love, but with a smirk, Cell retorts they'll have to put that theory to the test, won't they? 
A moment later, he is upon Ribrian. His fists a blur of motion as he delivers a ruthless volley of blows that the Maiden can barely withstand, only blocking one in every three hits. Wanting to level the playing field, Ribrian retreats, jumping back and firing off a heart-shaped key blast, which Cell splits in half with a kick. He then responds with a key blast of his own, that being a death beam. Due to the no-killing rule, he avoids any vital areas, but the pain of having a hole burned cleanly through her body is enough to send Ribrian into shock. And as she lies there in agony, Goku is forced to grant his former subordinate the win. There is an angry rumbling from the participants as Cell returns to his teammates, with Gohan chastising the bioandroid for using excessive force. With a scowl, Cell replies that he was simply ensuring the quickest victory he could, before reminding Gohan that in this tournament there is no room for sympathy with the other teams, as by its very nature, this is kill or be killed, so the young guardian better get his priorities straight. A tense silence falls between Team Universe 7 after this, with them all watching as the next match begins, that being Nink from Universe 4 against Dr. Pepperoni from Universe 3. This looks to be a short match, as Nink is a hulking ogre of a man, while Pepperoni more closely resembles an eccentric old dandy than a fighter. However, looks can be deceiving, as seeing the size disparity between himself and his opponent, the scientist cries for his teammates to join him. At once the robots seated in the Universe 3 platform all fly into the ring, where they converge on Pepperoni transforming into a single giant entity that towers over Nink. From Team Universe 11's area, Jiren's partner, mustachioed alien named Topo, yells that this isn't fair, as fights are supposed to be one on one, but with a belly laugh, the creature declares that it is only one person, Ani Raza, the ultimate fighter from Universe 3. Weighing this up, the Omni King declares that he'll allow it, since the idea of a kaiju fight sounds cool and entertaining, but since they're all now Ani Raza, they have to stay that way, or else they'll be disqualified. Also, to avoid giving them an unfair advantage, all the components' individual fights are now forfeited, meaning Topo, along with Kale and Frost from Universe 6, have been granted automatic entry into the second round. With this settled, the match resumes, though like everyone predicted, it is not a long one, as Nink's brute strength is nothing to Ani Raza, who simply nudges him off the edge with his foot, securing Universe 3's continued survival. After this is Raditz, who is paired against a man named Obni from Universe 10. Solemnly, Obni apologizes for the part he must play in the Seventh Erasure, saying that he is a wife and son back home, so for their sake, he must ensure Universe 10 is the one to survive. Nodding, Raditz acknowledges that he's in the same boat, pointing out Trunks and saying that for his son, as well as his wife and baby daughter, he will fight to his very last breath. Nodding, Obni sighs that perhaps in another life his son and Raditz's daughter could have played together as friends, but alas, it is not to be. With a sigh of his own, Raditz echoes this sentiment. Then, the fight begins. As it turns out, Obni has a special ability, that being such a cute key control that he can create key decoys, which make it impossible to tell where he actually is. This allows him to seemingly get an early lead, as Raditz misses his first few attempts at punching, while Obni peppers the Saiyan with hits. However, in spite of this disadvantage, Raditz remains calm, those new ice blue eyes piercing his opponent as if trying to read his mind. Then with a flick of his wrist, he launches his fingers which become five tiny missiles, each flying at a separate Obni. This stuns both with Trunks and Gohan, though with an eye roll, Cell tells them this is likely one of his new android upgrades, similar to 16's Rocket Fists, before instructing them to watch, as four of the fingers pass harmlessly through Obni's decoys, while the fifth bounces off his real body, telling Raditz which one it is. At once the augmented Saiyan descends upon his foe, tripping with a leg sweep, then leveling a shining fright at his head, urging him to surrender. Giving Raditz a saddened look, Obni replies that he's afraid he cannot bring himself to do it, before rolling away and restarting the fight. Recalling his fingers, Raditz hurls the key orb at Obni, but using his impressive physique, the green alien avoids this too, recreating his clones and coming in for another close range hit. Stepping back, Raditz attempts a roundhouse kick, hoping that he can cut through the clones and hit the real Obni, but unfortunately Universe 10's martial arts specialist is well equipped to deal with such techniques, rolling under the blow and driving a punch into the Saiyan's leg which brings him crashing to his knees. Now it is Obni's turn to offer Raditz a chance to surrender, but with a shake of his head, Raditz replies that he won't let his cowardice be the thing that costs his family their lives, so he's afraid it's time he end this, no matter the cost. Remembering Future Trunks' story of how his Raditz died, Gohan 
rises to his feet, urging his uncle not to do this, but it is already too late, as the long-haired sand has initiated his final explosion. A vast explosion of key then blankets of the battlefield, so intense that it even makes the jellyfish carrying Zeno's palace squirm in discomfort. Hastily, the angels erect barriers around their team so they are not caught in the blast, but being at Grand Zero, Obni has no such luck, taking the full brunt before being sent soaring far out of bounds. The explosion persists for a few more moments before dying down, and as the barrier around Team Universe 7 is lowered, Gohan and Trunks leap down into the arena to check on Raditz. To their surprise, he is not only still alive, but still standing, and when he sees their worried faces, he pulls the boys into a hug, reassuring them that he's fine. In fact, thanks to his new android body and infinite energy engine, he could do that all day and be fine. Well, maybe not all day, as while he has the key for it, that explosion still damages him as well, so he probably won't be doing that again for the rest of the tournament. Laughing with relief, Gohan slinks his uncle's arms around his shoulder and carries him back towards their waiting area, while Trunks stays behind, as it is finally time for his match against Megeta, the Metal Man from Universe 6. Megeta is a fearsome opponent, and when the call is given for the fight to begin, he shows why he was chosen for his universe's team, being both quite strong as well as surprisingly agile for such a big guy. As a result, Trunks is forced to fight on the defensive, using hit and run tactics to strike his opponent then dash away. Unfortunately, these seem to not even make a dent in the Metal Man's steely hide, causing Trunks to power up into Super Saiyan. Even in this form, Trunks cannot make any headway, with him soon jumping into Super Saiyan 2, though this yields just as few results. Figuring that maybe fisticuffs aren't the answer, Trunks next employs a double Sunday, hoping the beam will do what his punches can't. Unfortunately, here too Maget has a counter, spitting a gout of lava which matches and then quickly overcomes the double Sunday. This all happens so quickly that Trunks barely has time to leap away, though not before he receives a nasty steam burn on both hands, causing him to yell this is not cool, while calling Megeta a stupid bucket of bolts. At once the Metal Man bursts into tears, halting his assault and giving Trunks an idea. Adopting a cruel smirk, he begins to hurl insults and trash talk, with a frequency and fluidity that makes it abundantly clear he is his parents' son. Megeta for his part simply grows more and more distraught, clapping his his hands over his ears and running in the opposite direction. Seeing this is his chance, Trunks leaps at the fleeing Metal Man's back, his feet extended for a two-footed kick. Then at the last second, he enters his ultimate state, employing his full potential for just a moment to boot the bot in the butt, sending him tumbling off the jellyfish and securing Trunks' advancement to round two. The next three matches then all skip thanks to the formation of Aniraza, meaning it is time for Gohan to face his opponent now, a young woman named Kakunsa from Universe 2. Somewhat unsurprised, Surprisingly at this point, Kukunsa has a special ability, with hers being that she possesses all the powers of a jungle cat, a fact she explains to Gohan as she flashes her claws, declaring he'll pay for what his teammate did to poor Ribrienne. Gulping, Gohan protests that he had nothing to do with that, and he actually told Cell off for his brutality, but Kukunsa doesn't want to hear it, lunging at the Guardian and slashing at him with her claws. Bringing up an arm to defend himself, Gohan feels hot blood trickle down at his Kukunsa's claws cut deep. A troubling portent of things to come, as the wildest member of the Kamikaze Fireballs goes in for a follow-up. This time Gohan darts back, avoiding the blow, before stepping back in and delivering a punch to Kakunsa's gut that sends her leaping into the air with a hiss, her hair standing on end. Noticing this cat-like behavior, Gohan quickly comes up with a plan, creating a small low-powered beam of red key, similar to a laser pointer, and aiming it at the floor. At once Kakunsa's feline instincts kick in, with her dropping to all fours and attempting to catch the laser, something Gohan capitalizes on, having the red dot dart closer and closer to the edge until finally Kakunsa pounces with a bit too much zeal and goes tumbling headfirst into the open sky. Deactivating his key dot, Gohan laughs this sure was an odd fight, though his flippancy fades completely when the Grand Priest voice rings out once again, declaring Universe 2 has also lost all its fighters, resulting in Zeno erasing it just like Universe 9. Suddenly Gohan doesn't feel much like laughing at all, with a sober air surrounding him as he takes a seat between Raditz and Trunks. However, now is not the time to give in to sorrow, as with the first round done, the second round is set to begin. Just as with round one, Hit opens by scoring an easy victory, using that same teleportation trick to close the distance and one-shot his opponent. After this comes something no one had considered up until now, a matchup between teammates, with Ganos and Daemon of Universe 4 being slayed to fight each other. 
Curiously, Genos asks Goku what they're supposed to do, and after a brief conversation with the Omni King and Grand Priest, the Saiyan shrugs they're meant to fight, or he guesses one of them could forfeit, since apparently that's how Zeno wants it. Acknowledging this, Daemon decides to surrender, deeming Genos as having the better chance of saving their universe, and so it is the second match of the second round ends without a single punch being thrown. The fight that follows sees Universe 4's invisible fighter Gamus Salas take out Dyrosem of Universe 10, which results in the 10th Serasia, as he was their last fighter. As Team Universe 10 meets their end, they do not cry out like their predecessors, instead facing their death stoically, with Obni's final act being to make eye contact with Raditz. Then a moment later, they are gone, and as the long-haired Sam stares at the place where Obni just was, he hangs his head, mourning for the man that another time he might have called friend. Next up to fight is Jiren, this time paired with a girl named Khalifla, who apparently is a Saiyan from Universe 6. Gohan, Rats, and Trunks are all intrigued by this fact, wondering what it would be like to fight another universe's Saiyan, but alas, that is something they will never know, or at least, not with her, as just by flaring his aura, Jiren dispatches Khalifla. A moment later she appears in the Universe 6 area, her body comatose and injuries looking pretty severe. Upon seeing this, another member of Team Universe 6, a girl named K who up until now had been meek and subdued, starts going berserk. By the spiking of her hair and power, the Universe 7 team recognize this as Super Saiyan, but the greenish tinge of it is unlike any Super Saiyan state they have ever seen. In this feral state, Kale cannot tell friend from foe, swiping at one of her own teammates, and she is only stopped by the appearance of Hit, who employs a technique called Time Prison to freeze her in place by creating a purplish sphere of ki in one hand. Now it is Cell's turn to fight again, with him being paired with Ani Raza this time. Cracking his knuckles, the bioandroid declares this will be fun as he re enters the ring and looks up at the smirking face of the Universe 3 super android. Tauntingly, Aniraza asks Cell if he's scared, but the Bugman shrugs that honestly he's not. In hell he fought giant ogres and other miscellaneous big brutes all the time, so this is just another day on the job for him. Though he will admit, he is looking forward to dismantling a fellow android, since he wants to see how Universe 3 builds theirs. As flight is not allowed, Cell starts by propelling himself into the air with a key blast aimed at the ground. A clever tactic, as it forces Ani Raza to attack a moving target. Unfortunately for the Universe 3 android, he is not up to the task, as Cell deftly dodges his swipes and even goes so far as to land on one of his arms. Growling, Ani Raza attempts to squash Cell with his other fist, but with a cackle, Cell springs out of the way, causing the kaiju to smash his fist into his wrist gem, shattering it and exposing what is housed inside, one of the robots making up the behemoth. Smirking, Cell extracts the machine from its socket and tosses it out of the ring, causing the arm it had seemingly controlled to go limp, a fact which Cell takes keen notice of as he leaps onto the next arm, his eyes set squarely on Ani Raza's remaining wrist gem. Charging up a Kamehameha, Cell quickly obliterates the red rock, and to no one's surprise, another Universe 3 android lies nestled within. Grabbing hold of it, Cell casually tosses the machine away, disabling Ani Raza's second arm, and leaving it vulnerable as the biobug runs up its shoulder and takes aim at the third and final red gem, that being on its forehead. Once more a key blast does away with it, and as its inhabitant is removed, something strange starts to happen. Ani Raza begins to lose its shape, with the giant body retracting into the single green gem on its chest. Jumping onto the gem, Cell sneers down at the terrified form of Dr. Paparoni, then with a fierce stomp, he shatters the casing, exposing the good doctor, who he subsequently yanks out. However, instead of casting him aside like his teammates, Cell stares into Paparone's eyes, coldly telling him that he simply despises men like the doctor. Scientists who treat their creations as nothing more than tools for their own ambitions, rather than sentient artificial life. Were he still the being he was in his younger days, he would have found great pleasure in extracting his pound of flesh from Paparone in place of his own creator, but as it stands, he simply feels revulsion for the snivelling wretch, and so wants nothing more to do with him. With these words, Cell drop kicks Paparone out of the arena, then as Zeno erases Universe 3, the insectoid warrior looks up to the Universe 7 platform, informing Raditz and Trunks that he looks forward to fighting one of them in the next round. Looking up at the bracket, Trunks and Rats are surprised to see the bio-android is right, and that the next fight to determine Cell's quarterfinal opponent is between father and son. Eyes meeting, Trunks suggests that he should just forfeit like Daemon, so his dad can be better rested for his fight with Cell. But Raditz flatly refuses, telling his son this would be a disservice to their universe. If he wants to do right by everyone, then the two of them need to accept this challenge and go all out to see who is really best suited to represent the 7th moving forward. Though he is still a bit reluctant to fight his dad, 
said. Trunks accepts these terms, and so the pair takes Cell's place, with Goku telling them to begin when they are ready. Taking his father's words to heart, Trunks goes all out from the start, going into his ultimate form and lunging at Raditz. Raditz for his part doesn't transform, with Gohan wondering whether perhaps in becoming an android he lost that ability, but even still, he's able to match his son, ducking under the first punch and delivering an elbow between Trunks' shoulders. This slams the boy into the ground, but having excellent instincts, he immediately rolls, avoiding Raditz's follow-up kick and firing a point-blank double Sunday up at his dad. However, here Rad shows off another of his new android modifications, extending a hand and absorbing the blast into a small red gem on his palm. Up in the viewing area, Gohan recognizes this as the same device Android 19 had in his hands, and so is ready when Rats explains that Trunks has just enhanced his strength considerably with that blast. He then follows up with a kick that sends the young hybrid flying, but through sheer grit and determination, Trunks is able to grab hold of the ring's edge, keeping himself in the fight as he claws his way back into a standing position. From the other side of the battlefield, Reddits praises his son's tenacity, saying he is very proud of the boy, though a part of him wishes Trunks had stayed down since he doesn't want to keep beating him like this. Adopting the cocky grin of youth, Trunks replies this fight is far from over, and until it is, he's going to keep fighting his very hardest to prove that he is as much of a proud Saiyan warrior as his dad. The pair then clash again, this time with Trunks relying on punches and kicks to avoid accidentally giving Reddits further power boosts. Reddits for his part seems invigorated by the remnants of the Double Sunday's power, and uses this to push his son to the limit driving several powerful punches into his ribs and face. However, good to his word, Trunks does not falter, taking his licks and then coming back twice as hard. Due to being tall like his father but less bulky, Trunks' strikes are more nimble and speedy, with him getting in two blows for every one he takes. Against any other foe, this would be a decisive advantage, but as Raditz so aptly reminds his progeny, with his android upgrades, he's not going to get worn out by this onslaught. So if Trunks wants to win, he'll either need to hit hard enough to knock him out, or somehow get him out of the ring. Two outcomes that seem less and less probable with each exchange, as unlike him, it is clear that the boy is starting to tire. Though Trunks hates to admit it, his dad is right. He has begun to rapidly fatigue, and this makes him vulnerable to Raditz's counters, meaning if he wants to win this, he needs to change tack. Key Blasts have already proven themselves to be a non-starter, and close combat isn't working, so what else is there? Unfortunately, Trunks doesn't have time to ponder this, as Raditz is back on the offensive, this time with a double Sunday of his own. Thinking fast, Trunks meets it with an identical attack, beginning a beam struggle which seemingly cannot end in his favor, as he will either be overwhelmed by his father's infinite energy, or or if he wins, Raditz will simply absorb it like any other potential bean he hurls. Wait a minute. Potential? That is the area where he still outstrips his father. While his dad does possess infinite energy, its power caps out at the level of his augmentations, while as a hybrid, he has a limitless well of potential he can draw upon, and with this ultimate form, he might have just what he needs to utilize it. Breathing deeply, Trunks focuses on reaching deep inside himself, marshalling every ounce of ability he has to create a single perfect attack that will represent the totality of what he is and all he aspires to be. At once, his double Sunday grows exponentially in both size and power, and as he lets out a massive scream, the purple blast consumes his father's beam, and then the man himself. Try as he might, it is too much key for Rats' energy absorption upgrade to handle, and so when the light fades, the long-haired Sen is on his back, unable to move. From the sidelines, Goku declares his brother as being unable to battle, and as Trunks lands beside his dad, he asks if he's alright. Sitting up with some assistance, Raditz grins that he's better than alright. He's proud. This is what all their training has been for, the day when Trunks would unequivocally surpass his father and take his place standing at the Guardian's side. A little awkwardly, the boy protests that he isn't trying to usurp his dad's position or anything, but with a chuckle, Raditz replies that this is how it should be. He and Gohan are the young, strong ones now, so so it's only right they take up the mantle of leadership, since like it or not, the days of him and Kakarot leading the charge have been and gone. He then wraps his son in a hug, congratulating him on his win, and urging him to win the whole tournament. Back at the Universe 7 waiting area, Kibito uses his power to heal up the pair of Saiyans after their climactic duel, while down below, Frost faces Topo. This is a shockingly short match, though a highly memorable one. As being an underhanded little sneak, Frost attempts to win by poisoning his opponent. Unfortunately for him, Topo's heavy layering of both fat and muscle shields him from this, with the dirty trick enraging the Universe 11 fighter so much that he declares sportsmanship dead and ascends into a hulking form that his universe's destroyer label
labels as his god of destruction candidate state. Wielding the full might of a destroyer god, Topo Hakai's frost in an instant, though he is spared from erasure himself thanks to some clever reasoning from the Universe 11 angel Markareda, who implores Lord Zeno to accept this as Topo simply saving the Omni King the effort of erasing Frost for breaking the rule about lethal force. Following this, it is time for Gohan to fight again, this time facing off against Kale, who is still trapped in Hit's time prison. When the pre-epic fighter releases his hold on the Berserk Saiyan, she barrels towards the Guardian, frothing at the mouth with widened out eyes. Recognizing this fury, Gohan enters his own rose-tinted rage form and clashes with her head on. The resulting shockwave agitates the great jellyfish just as much as Raz's final explosion, though this is not to be a one-off thing, as the pair of fighters quickly engage in a bout of traded blows, delivering swift punches and kicks to each other that each come with their own explosive force. Splitting apart, Gohan acknowledges that Kale has a lot of power, though it's raw and unhoned, just like he was in the early days of using Super Saiyan Rage, but with a bit of guidance, he can help her harness it if she wants. Kale's only response is to snarl as she hurls herself at him once again, though this time Gohan dodges, even managing to trip her by simply sticking out a leg. Such an obvious ploy wouldn't work against a rational fighter, with Gohan saying as much to prove his prior point. This unfortunately does little to help with his goal of calming her down, as now with pain fueling her rage, Kale lashes out, attempting to claw at her foe much like Kakunsa did. Leaping back from this, Gohan next lobs an orb of ki at the Berserker, but even this is not enough to stop her, as she merely bats the blast aside, then delivers a haymaker into his shocked face. For a moment, Gohan sees stars, with Kale using this time to deliver a dozen forceful body blows to his unprotected torso. Coughing up blood, Gohan realizes that now is not the time to hold back, even if he does want to help his fellow Saiyan, and so gives in to the building fury he has been resisting after it made him sloppy against Cell. Flaring his key, Gohan knocks Kale back, then tackles her to the ground with a heavy thump. As the bulky bruiser's head hits the arena floor, Gohan growls at her to yield, though it seems Kale isn't even paying attention to him, as her shocked face is staring at something behind him. Then, he hears a voice, that of Khalifla, as she cheers for her teammate, and looking back, Gohan sees the young woman good as new thanks to some healing from Kibito. This sight triggers a change in Kale, as Gohan feels her shrink beneath him, her extreme musculature becoming more like that of a regular Super Saiyan, while cyan pupils blossom in the endless white of her eyes. It seems that this metamorphosis has also given Kale her sense of reason back, as with an overjoyed voice, she cries Khalifla's name, expressing her delight that the other woman is okay. Flashing a rebellious grin, Khalifla replies that she won't be kept down that easily, but now's not the time for that. It's time for her to use that wicked new transformation to kick this Gohan guy's butt. Nodding determinedly, Kale agrees, then with a cry, she powers up, knocking Gohan off her. As both Saiyans rise to their feet, their eyes meet, though this is not like the start of their clash. Now Kale is in full possession of her faculties and is fighting with purpose. Gohan reflects on this as he and Kale begin the next round of their duel. She was able to gain control of her rage form, not through training and discipline like he did, but through a bond with Khalifla, and as a result, has become exponentially more powerful. He wonders, had he taken that route, would he be stronger too? Would he have been able to defeat Cell back in hell and keep everyone safe? Gohan doesn't know, but one thing he is certain of is that if he doesn't focus up, he will lose this fight and let his universe down. That is something he refuses to let happen, and so with a cry, he subsumes himself in rage, slowly but surely overpowering Kale. Finally, this results in him using a front kick to push his adversary away, just long enough to charge up a Kamehameha. At this range, Kale is unable to avoid it, and as she is sent hurtling into the void beyond the ring, Gohan hears her mutter three words, I'm sorry, Khalifla. Looking up at the Universe 6 area, Gohan sees Kale materialize, her hair now black again, and her head hung low as she apologizes to her teammates. However, Khalifla will not hear of it, throwing an arm around the other woman and cheering that her fight was the most epic thing she's ever seen, and that she needs to teach her how to transform like that. Smiling softly, Kale promises to do that when they get home, an unspoken worry to her voice, though Hit is there to put it to rest, as it is his turn to fight again, as the opener of the quarterfinals. His match with Ganos is just as brief as his first two, as while Ganos has the power to increase his speed several fold, that is nothing compared to a man who can jump ahead in time. By now Gohan, along with several of the more observant fighters, have figured out that this is his power, and so it comes as no surprise that he removes Ganos from the tournament in a matter of moments. As always, Jiren follows him, eliminating Gamisalus in no time at all, since invisibility is no match for a power that can blanket the entire battlefield. As a result of this loss, Universe 4 is eliminated, leaving only three universes standing, Universe 6, Universe 7, and Universe 11.
The third quarterfinal match is between two of the seventh's remaining fighters, Trunks and Cell. Trunks is eager to knock the bio-android out of the tournament, knowing how much his continued presence distresses Gohan, and as he joins his opponent in the ring, both his cousin and his father pat him on the back, wishing him luck for his fight. When the call to begin is given, Trunks enters his ultimate form, showing that he is not messing around, then with a yell, throws himself at Cell. At first, Cell tries to dodge these hits, but Trunks is too fast, giving the bug quite a beating. Retreating after a few hits, Cell acknowledges the boy's strength, claiming that by his estimates, Trunks is the fourth strongest fighter here, but unluckily for him, he's the second strongest. Cell then powers up into his Cell God state for the first time in the tournament, with all the remaining fighters taking notice. At once, the tide of the battle changes, as when Trunks rushes in, Cell swats his hits away, before delivering a lariat that puts the young hybrid on his back. Not one to give up an advantage, Cell follows Trunks down before he can move, planting his chitinous red knees on the boy's torso and pinning him in place. He then smirks that Trunks is free to surrender at any time, but when the onyx head youth spits back a defiant refusal to yield, the biobug rolls his eyes and plants both his hands around Trunks' throat. What follows is a sight that makes Raditz and Gohan's stomachs turn, as Cell holds Trunks down and starts choking the life out of him. Trunks fights valiantly to his last breath, quite literally, but soon enough, his face goes red and he passes out. As soon as this happens, Cell is back on his feet, having seemingly lost interest when Trunks could no longer entertain him. Giving his fellow Hellfighter a piercing look, Goku declares Cell the winner, and as Raditz goes to retrieve his son, Gohan transforms into his rose-tinted rage state and confronts Cell, warning him that once he beats Topo, he's coming for the Bugman, and when he does, he's gonna make Cell pay for Trunks and everyone he's hurt. Cell Miller replies with a taunt that he's sure the fight will be scintillating, even if Gohan's choice of threats is not, before returning to the waiting area so Gohan can have his match. When he enters the ring, Topo is still in his God of Destruction mode, his glowing purple eyes and new muscly physique giving him an intimidating air. Nonetheless, Gohan doesn't spare any thought for this, or the increase this form has given to his already considerable power, his mindset squarely on winning so he can avenge his little cousin. Something in this mindset gives him strength, as while he is still angry, it is not his usual wildfire of rage, instead being more like a flamethrower that he can aim and unleash at will, similar to the level of mastery he was able to attain with his original Super Saiyan rage form under Whis's tutelage. This allows him to go blow to blow with the Destroyer Candidate, who mercifully does not attempt to Hakai him like he did Frost, most likely since he didn't break any rules. However, this does not mean he is holding back, with his giant fist carrying equally massive hitting power. He also utilizes an aura of destruction whenever Gohan attempts to strike him with a key bolt, neutralizing the attack and making him all the harder to eliminate. Being roughly even in terms of power, this fight goes on for a while, as both warriors know that they could make all the difference in the outcome of this tournament, since if they fall, their universe will be down to its last defender. This spurs them both on, with each throwing more and more on their seemingly limitless reserves of godly power, the Destroyer versus the Guardian. However, in spite of appearances, Gohan is starting to fatigue from the exertion of this prolonged battle, and clearly, so is Topo. Due to this, and the fact that he is an incomplete mastery of his God of Destruction form, Topo decides to wrap things up by making an Orb of Destruction energy which he throws at Gohan. This is not intended to kill, but rather to wear the Saiyan out, as he figures that Gohan will expend the last of his energy trying to hold the Orb back, then when his strength gives out, he will fall safely to the ground, while the Orb flies overhead, making Topo the winner. As it turns out, the mustachioed menace is half right, as when the destruction energy flies at him, Gohan does indeed attempt to push it back with a Kamehameha. However, the thing Topo had not accounted for is that with his more focused rage, Gohan is actually able to do this. By thinking of all the people he loves who he will let down if he loses this fight, Gohan briefly ascends into a state beyond rose-tinted rage. This change is only visible for a second, but this is enough to empower the Guardian's Kamehameha, resulting in it sending the destruction orb right back at Topo, who scrambles to neutralize it while simultaneously being hit by Gohan's blast, which sends him crashing to the ground. A second later, Gohan also lands face first on the ground, and with neither warrior showing any sign of being able to continue, the Grand Priest asks Goku as adjudicator to reach a verdict. Scratching his head, Goku declares that in a case like this, he's going to use the rules from his first ever World Martial Arts Tournament. Whichever fighter can get to their feet first and declare themselves the winner gets the victory. Pursing his lips, the Grand Priest calls this an odd custom, but allows it, with everyone waiting to see who will rise first. For almost a full minute, no one stirs. Then with a gasp, Gohan raises his head. Excitedly, Trunks, Raditz, and the deities of Universe 7 cheer the young hero on. And hearing this, he forces himself to stand, 
saying in a shaky voice that he is the winner, and in doing so, making it true. Up in the Universe 7 area, Shin Kibito and the Grand Supreme Kai all clamor about how impressive Gohan's performance was, while in a sly whisper, Whis asks his master how he feels about this outcome, since Topo was said to be stronger than several active gods of destruction, possibly including Beerus. In a furious hiss, the cat forbids his attendant from revealing that fact to Gohan, causing the angel to titter that his lips are sealed, before greeting the returned guardian. After a fight like that, Gohan needs a fair amount of healing from Kibito, though as he receives it, the semi-finals begin, Hit versus Jiren. Taking to the field, the last fighters from Universe 6 and 11 square off, with Jiren even giving his opponent the courtesy of remaining on his feet and looking him in the eye. Hit meanwhile wastes no time, knowing precisely how dangerous Jiren is and what could happen if Universe 11's behemoth is able to land the opening blow. With this in mind, he time skips forward, appearing in front of Jiren and placing him in a time prison just like he did Kale. However, this is not the full extent of his plan, as by clutching the purple sphere that facilitates the time prison in one hand, Hit is able to rain down a flurry of punches on Jiren's helpless body. Utilizing his time powers to accelerate his strikes, Hit is able to make it appear as though he has a thousand arms at once, each hitting Jiren before being replaced with another. Through this trick, the Universe 6 assassin is able to push Jiren closer and closer to the edge of the ring, having concluded this is the only way he can defeat Jiren. Soon, the large grey alien is pushed to the very precipice, with Hit readying one last blow, which he hopes will send Jiren flying. Drawing back his fist, he swings, declaring this is for his universe, but then, just before he can make contact, Jiren's hand shoots up, grabbing the punch. Gasping, Hit asks how this is possible, but with an undertone of exertion to his voice, Jiren declares that it actually took him marshalling his strength to break free of this technique, so he has to admit, he's impressed. Then with a grunt, he brings up his other fist, breaking free of the time prison entirely, and uppercutting Hit's jaw. The force of a direct blow from Jiren is enough to knock Hit out cold, but all the same, the Pride Trooper is thorough, picking his downed foe up by the head and dropping him off the ring. As he does, he solemnly states that the assassin has his respect, and that even when his universe is erased, Hit will live on in his memories. A moment later, Hit's beaten body appears up in the Universe 6 area, and as Jiren had said, he along with his universe are promptly erased. Now only two universes remain, Universe 7 and Universe 11, with the last two warriors from the former being matched up for the right to challenge Jiren in the finals. This is what Gohan has been waiting for, a rematch with his nemesis, but it seems Cell has other ideas, as raising his voice, he says here's a suggestion to make the tournament more exciting if the Omni King would be interested. Always eager for more spectacle, Zeno tells the bug to speak, and with a smarmy grin, Cell states that they already know the finals will be Universe 7 vs Universe 11, but what if instead of being a 1v1 that can end too quickly, he and Gohan team up to face Jiren, like how Team Universe 3 are able to team up and become Aniraza? Lighting up, Zeno declares that he did like Cell's fight with Aniraza very much. Okay, he and Gohan can fight as a tag team against Jiren. Rising to his feet, Gohan furiously hisses at Cell, demanding to know what he's doing, but with a smug grin, the bioandroid answers that he's saving their universe. Neither of them stand a chance against Jiren alone, so this way at least there's hope. Seeing that he has no choice in the matter, Gohan fumes that Cell better not be trying anything funny, hopping down into the ring with the Bugman by his side. On Goku's call to start, both Universe 7 fighters go into their highest transformations, though Gohan goes a step beyond, immersing himself completely in the angry feels of being forced to work with Cell, as well as being denied his chance to get payback on the being who has caused him so much pain. This fury leaves him barely more cognizant than Kale was at the start of their battle, and without hesitation, he throws himself at Jiren. In this state of heightened emotion, Gohan is just as sloppy as he was when he and Cell last fought, making it child's play for Jiren to evade all his attacks before retaliating with one of his own, a point-blank key blast that sends Gohan soaring backwards while the resultant shockwave digs a furrow in the ground all the way to the arena's edge. Were Gohan fighting alone, this would be the end for him, but thankfully, Cell is there, catching his wayward partner and scolding him for going off half-cock. Blind as he is by fury, Gohan swings at Cell for this, but with the same ease as their last bout, Cell counters this, knocking Gohan's hand away and looking him squarely in his whited out eyes. In a blunt tone, he tells the young half saying that he gets it. Gohan hates him because he killed someone he loved. But guess what? Unless he pulls himself together, Gohan will be responsible for the death of everyone he loves. So if he wants to hate him, fine. If he wants to fight him again when this is done, honestly, he'd welcome the challenge. But right now, Gohan needs to stop feeling so goddamn sorry for himself and help him take out this big grey brute. 
gritting his teeth, Gohan asks what the bug has in mind, and with an approving nod, Cell answers that he'd had the right idea. The only way to beat Jiren is to knock him off the edge. To do that, he'll need to charge up a massive attack, which will require Gohan to keep Jiren distracted for a while. Nodding, Gohan states that he can do that. Then without another word, he strides forward, approaching Jiren again. Appraisingly, the Grey Alien asks what the Saiyan wants, suggesting that he can't honestly think he can beat him alone. But with a shake of his head, Gohan answers that he wants to see if he can take one of Jiren's punches better than Hit did. This absurd answer makes Jiren raise his bald brows in surprise, but seeing no reason to refuse, he pulls back his fist and uppercuts Gohan. Unsurprisingly, this blow sends the young guardian crashing to the ground with enough force to create a crater, but as he staggers back to his feet and spits out a mouthful of blood, he instructs the Universal 11 fighter to hit him again. This time Jiren goes for a body blow, forcefully extracting all the air from Gohan's lungs and bringing him to his hands and knees. Coldly, he asks if that was good enough for the Earthling yet, but with a shake of his head, Gohan Gohan gets to his feet and gestures for Jiren to go again. This quickly becomes a pattern, with Jiren laying into Gohan while the Guardian refuses to yield, returning to his feet each time and requesting further beatings. For the life of him, Jiren cannot fathom what is motivating this young fighter, though the answer is quite simple. It's what Cell said, if he falls here, then everyone he loves will die. So with each new blow, he thinks of one of them, visualizing the situation as him putting his body between them and the power of Jiren's fist. This strive to protect them gives him strength, not only allowing him to endure, but to do so with courage, so those watching will not worry about him. Finally, this becomes too much for Jiren, who demands to know why Gohan keeps willingly facing such torture. Adopting a resolute tone, Gohan answers that it's his job as Guardian, saying that to his father, the role of Guardian was one who sought out danger and eliminated it before it could become an issue. But he has realized that to him, the position means something very different. To him, the Guardian is not a sword, but a shield, one who stands between pain and those they are sworn to protect, one who can carry any burden and endures no matter what. With this declaration, Gohan at last feels the peace of surety, and with it comes a new wellspring of power as he truly embraces his role in the hierarchy of the gods. This manifests through a change in his appearance, as his hair finally loses the sickly pinkish yellow color, becoming bright pink, while his eyes regain their pupils, now a steely gray. Noticing this, Jiren attempts to go in for a finishing blow, once more forming a key orb in his hand, but this time Gohan is ready, creating a shining Friday which clashes with Jiren's attack before blowing them both back. Looking back, Gohan sees that Cell has not yet finished charging his attack, and so engages Jiren once more, though this time he does not passively take the Grey's hits, instead catching the blows and retaliating with a few of his own. While these are not enough to seriously injure Jiren, the power of Super Saiyan Rose does allow Gohan to actually hurt the Behemoth, something that up until now has not happened. This flusters the Universe 11 fighter, who declares that Gohan's ideals of fighting for others should not be enough to overcome his doctrine of absolute strength. But from behind him, Gohan hears Cell retort that it's more than just fighting for others. It's about trusting them, and in turn being worthy of their trust. He then yells for Gohan to move, and with barely a second to spare, the young Saiyan darts aside as a super-powered Kamehameha passes right through the place he was just standing to strike Jiren in the chest. Like Cell promised, this pushes Jiren back to the edge of the ring, and seeing their chance, the champions of Universe 7 converge on the big brute, tackling him out of the ring and into the void below. However, being a tricky fighter, Cell is not out of surprises yet, and so just before they can reach the point where they will be teleported back to their respective team areas, he fires a blast into Gohan's stomach, catching him off guard and sending him sailing back onto the stage where he lies, the Soul Victor. A moment later, Jiren and Soul reappear in the universe 11 and 7 waiting areas respectively, and as Gohan looks up at his unwilling battle partner, he realizes something. While he still loathes Cell, and will until the day he dies, he cannot deny what the bio-android said is true. He has reformed his ways, and through his actions, has proven himself just as much a guardian of their universe as Gohan is. Floating over to him, the Grand Priest congratulates Gohan on being the winner of the Tournament of Power. Then as Universe 11 is erased, the young man is presented with a choice. He can either accept his victory here and guarantee the survival of his universe, or he can gamble it all on one last fight for a wish on the Super Dragon Balls, which as the Priest says, can grant any wish imaginable.
Meeting his teammate's eyes, Gohan gives them an apologetic look. He is sure his uncle Raditz as well as Sol would choose the safety of their universe considering all they have sacrificed for it already, but they are not the only ones who have sacrificed, with all those who had their lives cruelly stolen having given far more. For their sake, and for the sake of the other fighters in this tournament, each of whom was a guardian to their own universe, he cannot let this injustice stand, and so in a ringing voice, he declares that he will accept the final fight, for the right to wish the other universes and their inhabitants back into existence. Giving Gohan a look that the young hybrid assumes is one of annoyance, the Grand Priest sighs that very well, he should get himself healed by his universe's apprentice Kai before returning to the ring, as the opponent he is about to face is unlike any other. Assuming he is about to fight the Omni King or the Grand Priest himself, Gohan goes over what he knows of them in his head as Kibito heals him. Though to his surprise, when he steps back onto the battlefield, he is met by his father, who grins that he was hoping Gohan would accept the challenge, since he's really been looking forward to their rematch. With Goku as a competitor, it falls to the Grand Priest to declare the start of this match, and on his call, both fighters run at each other, opening the battle with a flurry of punches and kicks. It seems they are evenly matched, though this is hardly a concern, as this was just to gauge each other's strength, and see how they stack up to each other after their last match on the Sacred World of the Kais. Having gotten the testing out of the way, the battle begins in earnest, with Gohan firing a beam barrage at Goku, though with a laugh that'll take more than that to beat him, Goku rushes towards his son, batting the blasts away and closing in. A moment later he delivers a powerful haymaker to Gohan's jaw, but resilient as ever, Gohan takes the hit and uses the force of being knocked back to power up his retaliatory gut punch that sends Goku spiraling into the air. Catching himself in midair, Goku hovers above his son, praising all the effort he's put into his training, but asks why he doesn't go into Super Saiyan Rose like he did with Jiren. With a grin, Gohan admits that he didn't want to end things too fast, since even if this is for the sake of the universe, he's missed his dad and is enjoying this chance to fight him again. Grinning as well, Goku promises the young man's concerns are unfounded, as he has a new transformation as well. He then lets out a scream, as his hair spikes up like it does when he goes Super Saiyan, except this time his hair is a light blue color, a new state that the sand is aptly named Super Saiyan Blue. Powering up into Super Saiyan Rose, Gohan flies up to meet his dad, and when their fists collide, the arena and its surroundings shake. This is the power of a deific duel. Being in midair, the two combatants are able to be more flexible with their attacks, with Goku attempting to kick his son from above, or Gohan ducks and weaves, soaring behind his dad and striking him in the back with a point-blank key blast. This sends Goku tumbling end over end as he has to frantically pat himself down to put out his flaming clothes, but even still, he is ready for Gohan's follow-up, blocking the punch with a forearm and swinging a roundhouse kick into the young man's ribs. Gasping for air, Gohan is helpless against the two-handed hammer blow that follows, however unlike the last match, he does not go crashing into the ground, instead landing on his hands and feet, then springing directly back up. This quick recovery shocks Goku, and so it is that instead of clashing fists like they did before, both Saiyans punch each other in the cheek, their arms wrapped around one another. Breaking apart, Goku chuckles that it seems like they're back in the same situation as last time, a perfect match, to which Gohan takes the words out of his mouth, saying there's only one way to decide this then, a beam struggle. Landing back on the ground, Goku and Gohan both begin charging up their Kamehamehas, with neither holding anything back as the two sky-colored orbs grow between their palms. When both are ready, they fire the blasts in tandem, with them meeting in the middle and causing everything to start shaking again. At first, it seems like this will be a stalemate ending in the same explosion as last time, a dire outcome, as technically the Grand Priest had said Gohan had to win to ensure his universe's survival, so a draw may not suffice. But then, something strange happens. Gohan's Kamehameha begins to push push Goku's back, consuming it little by little. Yelling at the top of his lungs, Goku attempts to add more power to the beam, but even with this boost, Gohan's attack still proves superior, picking up speed as it consumes more and more of Goku's Kamehameha. By the light of the two beams, Gohan can see his father's expression clearly, though it is not one of fear or anger, but joy. And as the young guardian's Kamehameha consumes him, he smiles that he knew Gohan had it in him. In the aftermath, Goku lays sprawled on the ground, and ignoring the words of the Grand Priest and Zeno, Gohan rushes in to check on his dad. However, to his surprise, he finds Goku still grinning as he laughs that Gohan's strength is truly amazing. He went all out, and he still couldn't beat him. But you know what? That's okay, since he always knew Gohan's potential would lead to him surpassing him one day. Gohan isn't sure what to say to this, but it seems Goku doesn't feel like any reply is needed, as he instead pokes the kanji on his son's chest, giggling that it's time they changed that. Gohan has grown far beyond being just his successor, he has become a far greater guardian than he could ever hope to be, and more than that, he is number one. 
With this said, the Grand Priest finally gets Gohan's attention, commenting slyly that he's been trying to tell him for some time now that he's the winner, since Goku technically disqualified himself the second he started flying. Rubbing the back of his head, Goku chuckles that he did kind of forget that rule. Though all the same, he appreciates him and the Omni King letting him finish the match, as it was the most fun he's ever had in a fight. Nodding his understanding, the Grand Priest asks Gohan if he still intends to make the same wish he stirred before the fight, and when the Guardian nods his head, the Angel summons Super Shenron and makes the request. A moment later, the erased participants all reappear in their respective waiting areas, though Gohan only has eyes for the Omni King, saying that he hopes the Mini Monarch doesn't take this as a sign of disrespect. He simply hates the idea of so many innocent people dying. Answering for his lord, the Grand Priest says that on the contrary, had Gohan made any other wish or refused to take on Goku, the seventh would have also been erased, since the true purpose of the Tournament of Power was to test if mortals deserved to exist despite their flaws, and thanks to Gohan's selfless actions, Lord Zeno now knows that they do. Letting out a big sigh of relief, Gohan breathes that he's glad he passed the test, then with the Omni King's permission, he returns to his friends and family. Upon seeing him, Trunks and Rats wrap him in a hug, while the Kais, Beerus and Whis all give their commendations for Gohan's performance. They all then proceed to head home, though before they go, they are stopped by Goku, who reveals that he's been asked to stay here at Zeno's palace, to train with the Grand Priest and play with the Omni King, so he doesn't know if he'll ever see his friends again. This naturally puts a slight dampener on everyone's mood, but pulling his son into a hug, Goku promises that they'll all be fine. After all, they really don't need him anymore. With Goku no longer returning with them, Team Universe 7's first stop is Hell, so they can return Cell. Here they are met by Bardock, with this being Trunks' first time meeting him, and Rats' first reunion with his father since he joined Vegeta's squad as a child. Being a gruff and stoic man, Bardock is not effusive with his praises, though after eyeing Trunks up and down, he admits that he's impressed with his younger grandson, having watched him in both the Sacred World Tournament and the Tournament of Power. He then turns to Raditz, who despite being bigger and older than his dad, quails a little, feeling like the small small boy he was on Planet Vegeta, who was such a disappointment to the man. However, instead of lambasting him, Bardock sticks out a hand, saying that he's proud of his firstborn. Despite not having much of a father, he grew into a damn fine one, as well as a better man and stronger warrior than he ever was. Clearing his throat, Raditz thanks his dad for the praise, then with a smile, clasps his hand. Meanwhile, Cell begins to stalk away in search of a new challenge, muttering that even after only a few hours away, Hell must be overrun with bad guys for him to deal with. Though, before he goes, his eyes fall upon Gohan, and for a moment, everyone assembled feels tense. Is this going to be the long overdue rematch Gohan's been talking about? However, instead of lashing out, Gohan merely gives the bio-android a nod of acknowledgement. Smirking, Cell returns the gesture, then at last turns his back on the group and strides away. Here the rest of Team Universe 7 go their separate ways, with the Kais, Beerus and Whis returning to their domains, while Gohan brings Trunks and Rats back to the lookout. Everyone is still waiting for them here, having clearly been on tenterhooks this whole time. Sounding like he's afraid to know the answer, Krillin asks how it went, though when Trunks beams that they won, everyone breaks into cheers. What follows is a celebratory party that lasts late into the night, with everyone living as though it is their last day on Earth, relieved by the fact that it is not. However, not everything is joyous, as when the party winds down, a few among them have some bittersweet announcements. The first is Raditz, who declares that this tournament has marked the end of his days as a leading member of the Dragon Team. He will of course still come to the group's aid if called, but he's not going to be joining the other Saiyans for their intense training with Whis anymore or anything like that. Instead, he'd like to spend his time helping bring up the next generation of heroes like Gohei and Bra when they're ready, while leaving the leadership up to the young bucks like Gohan and Trunks. Following him is Nappa, who explains that today marks an ending for him too, as when the party is done, he is going to be leaving Earth, and with the limited time he has left, he doesn't think he will be returning. In terms of concern, a number of Z fighters ask why, and where he's going, but with a smile, the bald man explains that he's finally found Vegeta. Turns out that he ran afoul of the Galactic Patrol shortly after leaving Earth, and in his weakened state from the fight with Frieza, they were able to apprehend him. He's been in the Galactic Prison ever since, which is why Nappa could never find him, but thanks to the bald man services to the universe, the patrol have agreed to release Vegeta into his custody, so long as they don't cause any more trouble. Since he doesn't have much time left, he figures he and Vegeta can spend that travelling around the galaxy like the old days, and he'll try to convince the prince to use his power for good. Maybe they'll even run into Prince Tarbo while they're out there, or else find somewhere nice to settle down. But either way, he's gonna use what time he has left to help his friend, like he should have all those years ago. 
On this contemplative note, everyone disperses, leaving Gohan, Janet, and Gohei as the only ones still up on the lookout. However, this is hardly an issue, as striding up to them, Gohan wraps his family in his arms. These are the people most precious to him in all the world, and the ones he fought for today. He will do whatever it takes to keep them happy and safe, but now at last, it looks as though they can all rest and enjoy this time of peace. And that's where we'll end this story. Thank you so much for coming on this journey with me. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave your thoughts, suggestions, or screams of rage in the comments below.